Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com, founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of Elite FTS for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. Now, onto the show. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. This is Dave Tate, and we are back with another Table Talk. We have J.M. Blakely back with us again and Sam Brown. So I know you have questions. We got things that we want to talk about. We got an agenda, but I got a question that came to me when I was driving back in here today because you're a, a student of the game. And we had some people out here today that you were working with. We were filming some content. What did you learn today? That's an excellent question. Um, and, and this is a, uh, a sort of a reversal, right? So I have been thinking about what kinds of things would make me a better lifter for a long time, right? Dissected that down pretty well. But recently, I've been thinking about what will make me a better trainer. And you can learn something about how you train somebody every single session. Because even if you do the same thing over and over and over with the same person, there's a progression, right? You're expecting them to progress in their execution of something, in their mastery of something. Well, all you have to do is think, am I, am I progressing too? Am I getting through to them more and more and more each, each session, each, uh, each time we go somewhere? Am, am I moving too? Or am I just the same and I'm giving them the same cues and the same motivation and the same support? Or am, am I, because it makes a lot of sense and it's fair to say, if I expect them to get better, I should have that. And so I take in, each individual and I try to think to myself, where were we last time? What did we go over? And I, sometimes I have to have them re remind me. Where did we leave off? What did what we do? And then I think to myself, how am I going to change or adapt or improve or just do more or less of, of something to get to go with them to the next place that we want to go? And this is a recent development for me, mm -hmm. even thinking about... So I used to think, well, I have this knowledge and I can tell people this stuff. And I know how to, you know, do this and critique this and I'll just do that. And it's only till recently, t till I started really thinking about being a better coach, better motivator, better teacher, better personal trainer, that this, this idea that um, I can improve too. And not just by reading more stuff or, you know, trying to be creative and invent new things, but just by getting through touching people deeper and and that's pretty individual i know but it's uh it's something we should get, we, we would look at so if i was gonna train these guys again let's see what i would come up with to uh where i would go so uh, <clears throat> i trained uh, uh ryan and he's a bodybuilder guy and He's just starting in powerlifting. I think he's done one meet. And so his technique isn't very good. But what, what I did discover about him this time through that I can work on for next time through to be a better coach and trainer to him is I can see how he looks at the, the, the lifts through a very muscular viewpoint. Muscles, muscles, muscles. And that makes sense because he started in the, uh, the bodybuilding sphere. And when I asked him to think about his bony levers, the skeleton, and feel what that was happening as he pulled the deadlift up and the, and the weight from, went from the floor to stack up on his bones through his skeleton and into the, to the floor. It goes from the, the hands up to the shoulders, then back down through the spine, through the hips, splits over into both legs. And you can, you can feel that if you... Well, he couldn't feel it very well. And so we, we talked about this a little bit even. He... He was saying, uh, you know, I, I feel the muscles, but I I'm not sure what you're talking about with the, with the skeleton and the structure. And I, and I said, well, in, in powerlifting, um, it's a lot about 
the position of the joints and the structure and the support and you know the muscles move with the bony levers that's what their job is but you need to put those bony levers and things in the right relationship to each other if you want to be efficient and effective and so I think with him what I learned this time about him is that he, he needs more of that right now right away yeah, he's, he's good with muscles and he loves power and explosive he was too explosive even you know and so that that's what I learned about him today specifically and I learned more but that that comes to yeah, mind that's, first that's right one, so that's, that's easy right that's that's an easy answer there mm. but uh, and then let's think about uh, Dylan well you know when I spoke to Dylan at the beginning I asked him a few questions I don't know if people will see that or not but um, and one of the questions I, I said at the end is tell me something about yourself that I should know, that you want me to know about yourself. And we got, we got around to this uh, thing about strength. And he said, I, I, I said, who do you admire? And he said he admires people that are strong and strong. And upon further uh, evaluation of that, further consideration as we talked, the kind of strength that he admired, I immediately thought of people picking up heavy things, right? Mm-hmm. He's here at the gym, you know, he's lifting, he's a, he's a personal trainer. <laughs> the first thing I thought about. <laughs> I thought about physical strength, pick up yeah. 100, 200, 300, 400. He was really talking about, he told me he, he admired his, his mother for fighting a, a disease and, and her, her resilience, he said. He, I think he used the term resilience or something along that line, and her inner strength. And so we went off on this other tangent about how there's different, there's different kinds of strength, and you can learn a lot about inner strength I, I you know I, that's I preach this yes. you can learn a lot about inner strength from what happens in here you have the opportunities a lot of people do not but the opportunity to learn about inner kinds of strength and so with him uh, it, it was very clear that that was really important to him mm-hmm. you know so I mentioned you know I, I misunderstood you at first and I thought you just meant and and uh, so with him then for me to be a better trainer I, I have a I have a cue at what really motivates him and what really want what he wants. And I, I haven't talked to these guys a lot, but I already if I'm paying attention, if mm-hmm. I listen, mm-hmm. they'll they'll tell me who they are, right? Mm-hmm. People tell you who they are if you listen. And uh, in this case, I, I think that that's that's a direction I would take with him, is to is to uh, foster that thirst for inner strength and and give him challenges that don't just demand an out, outer strength, a superficial strength, but need, so, so you can give people physical tasks that they can accomplish with just physical up capabilities, but you can give people tasks and challenges that they cannot accomplish with just physical capabilities. They demand that you do something else. You think right, or you act right, or you believe, or you, and if you design the right challenge, He'll he'll be able to he'll be able to reach for that what he really wants, because he won't be able to do the physical challenge if he doesn't. And so that's where I would take him, and that's what I learned today. Well, with both of those, with the uh, examples that you just the breakdown that you just did, that's going to enable more buy-in. You mm-hmm. know, if it's a coach you're working with the athlete, because you're showing that obviously you care, yeah. and, and and with that buy-in, they're going to work harder as well. Yeah. Before we go, are we on uh, live? We are. With YouTube, can yep. can they let us know if the fan that is rolling? Yeah. Is that, so guys, we it's it's hot as hell in this gym, and we got a, <laughs> we got a fan rolling. If you guys can hear it, or if it's annoying, let us know, and uh, we can kind of adjust going forward. You um, said that it's a good time for me to wait. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> but one of the things that you you did today, Jam, and that I think it allowed the lifters that we had to essentially unlock more potential than I think they were even initially thought they were capable of having that conversation with Dylan about that resilience, about that strength. You could see it through the training that he was spending so much time internalizing things. He, we saw it initially with his deadlift. He was focusing so much internal that when you gave him the opportunity to experience having that wider view, he found success 
allowing his body to do the work while his brain went to a different place, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you could see that even with Ryan, it was the opposite. Like he was spending Sorry, so yeah. much time. So it was very cool to see that mm -hmm. sort of dynamic play out from that initial conversation. And you utilize that information going forward through even the challenge sets at the end. The language you used with each of them was different. Yes. Your direction with the conversation was different. Here's you, the question I'm going to throw back at you with this, though, yeah. because you presented your answer kind of like this was a new observation where I'm going to kind of guess this is how you've always trained people, but now you're just more aware that you're seeking because you worked as a trainer for many, many years. Yeah. Now you're also, uh, we can go down that road. I was competing. You were, I mean, it's a different when you're competing and you're a trainer, but you still want to get success out of those clients. Yeah. But you can't tell me that you weren't aware of the nonverbals that were going on mm. and all those other things. No, but, um, when, when, uh, when we started the school for the, I worked at a school that we, we made for on Tangi that was with, uh, <clears throat> My ex-wife uh, designed a program for kids that were at risk. They had, they weren't probably going to graduate, now, and the job, the job was to help them to graduate, to just give them that one chance, you know. Mm -hmm. A college education is great, but if you don't have a high school diploma, it's tough in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we, we learned a lot about um, what it takes to uh, verbal and nonverbal information and some of the things that she had me read to to uh, prepare myself to teach better were these uh, and, and and yes I agree with you you're right I knew that nonverbal communication existed I know that our first language is nonverbal for the first year we learn a hell of a lot of stuff maybe I don't know if you look at the percentages new things we learn in the first year without language and how much we learn every year after that man we learn a lot without language and we look at our mothers and we we, we we understand a nonverbal language, and everybody does. Everybody knows that, right? And so then it starts to go, and it gets sublimated. It doesn't really come up until you start to think about it. And people are very good at at reading some people. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they'll tell you. They'll be like, oh, I can, I can read a guy, right? And what they're saying probably is, without saying it, is that I'm good at picking up the nonverbal things. Mm -hmm. And some of the numbers that, that I had to read about... To, to, to properly put it into perspective. So I knew it was important, right? Everybody says it's important. But the numbers that I was reading about the studies of, of how much information is passed from one person to the next, verbally and non-verbally, what would you guess it at, Dave? When I, when I communicate some idea to you, how much of it came from the words I said and how much of it came from other things? I'm probably not the person to ask because I've- It's okay. You know the numbers. I don't know them exactly, but I know it's they're up there high. 80, 90%. Yeah. It's very yeah, they're high. high, 75, 80%. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm a, I'm a language guy. I love the language. I love to write. I love to speak. And I, I'm a language guy. And, I, and, and so I put out these words. And I think, well, they, everybody's going to know exactly all these words and what they mean and everything. And the, 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 that's not true. The studies say that the way we say it are everybody knows about inflection. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody knows about tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about mood. But then there's these body things that we can do. And we can, I mean, just a little lean. And, and there's people that study micro gestures of your mm -hmm. face. And and people pick that up. And they, <coughs> and, and kids especially. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. <coughs> kids especially, because they don't like to talk. Teenagers don't want to tell me what they're, what they're no, up to, right? They, and so I got to look and I got to listen and I got to hear what they say. And that's not as important as what I feel between them. Now that can get you in a lot of trouble too. Because you can you can think you feel something. Right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But but there's a lot of a lot of studies and a lot of guys, CIA agents and, and um, you know, people interrogators that were over in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and they, they know all about this, right? And I know a little bit about it, but I believe in it. It'd be I'm crazy to know about it but then be able to control your own micro expressions and expressions I think they, to I be think able they to try, right? Yeah. Some people are really good liars. And some people read people really well. And I think those people are more sensitive to this. And, it, and perhaps I was, I was sensitive to it, but then when I learned that I should be sensitive to it, that just changed the game for me. Yeah. I should pay attention to more stuff in that regard and how people, and so since I know that, you know, we both bounced, right? And so you know you have, a, you have an approach 
Mm-hmm. You got to throw somebody out, right? Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to get rough with anybody because I had to had to work out. I didn't want to hurt my hands. Yeah, and, right? Yes. I, and plus, I don't want to get all worked up. I just no. want them to go, right? No. And so, you would put on this game face, right? Mm-hmm. This, and you would approach them in sort of a you do not want for this to go down. You your best play right now is to forfeit. You should forfeit. Mm-hmm. And you come in that way and. And if they can, if you do it well, I think they feel it. And I got out of a lot of hard work that way, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my size was helpful. But, but the attitude and the approach, and not the words, I tried to get there first with that nonverbal. Yes. Because I didn't want to do all the, what's going on here? Why do they want you? And, and talking, and I want to stay, and you got to go, and I'm not going, and yes, you are. and. Uh, you know that's 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 nothing you want. But yeah. if if this if I can impress you that it's in your best interest to leave. Yeah, now, I think where I was going was energy. The I I once it was a few years ago. I, I once calculated how many hours I spent in the gym, my own training, training other people. Yeah. You know, and it, it it's freaking insane. Yeah. You know, it, it was actually more hours than anything else I've ever done in my life outside yeah. of sleeping. All right. Well, right. Maybe even close, right? It's it, yes. It's it's because <laughs> if you sleep in six, seven, out, it's four, upon, yeah. Six, how do we want to define sleeping? You're, you know? you're, yeah, I spent most of my adult life under a gym roof. Yes, we're under one right yes. now, and we're doing this. Exactly. I mean, that's like my office. You know, it's yeah, it's but we're under a gym yes, roof there, right um, now. But what I'm saying is, you're picking up all this stuff through. I mean, we're talking probably a hundred thousand hours. It's a lot of hours in that. If you're in the gym, just your training, and you got few people that you're training with you kind of know just by looking around dude you're not spotting the side this time or get your shit together right no you're not lifting out you you, you process you, the nonverbals that you're exposed to from a subconscious level yes for all those years I think that now you being more cognizant I can't say the word but more aware mm-hmm is allowing you to be able to find those things, but then know how to apply them. That's the I'm working on your application, but yeah, I'm I'm, I'm stumbling over them all the time now. Yes. Because of the awareness. And so that same sort of, so maybe I have a belief in myself that doesn't exist, but I think I do. So I think that I can get in front of somebody as a trainer in the same way I get in front of somebody as you got to go. And I can project non-verbally my support for them my desire for them to be successful my insistence that they give me a little bit more and i think i can do that with a, i guess we'll call it an aura but that that sort of sounds new agey and i'm not new agey but you know energy is the currency of the universe and so you can feel things from people and i think that when i get better and better at expressing that energy or vibration right or whatever I think that, and and I've had a lot more success right here with somebody than I do over the internet. And I try like crazy on the internet, I do. But when I'm right there, and they can sort of feel my breath on their Mm -hmm. neck, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that I believe I can can push them harder or get more from them or teach them better just by that all that nonverbal stuff and let's not call it an oral let's not even call it a uh, energy let's just say that they pick up the nonverbal cues and the body language and they know it from deep in their childhood and they know what I want from them mm-hmm. and they know when I'm not quite happy and they know when I, I think they can do better and they know when I need something from them and I want them to give it, not because I need it. I don't need it. If they give it, then they get something for it. Mm-hmm. And and that could be all bullshit. I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight about this because I'm gonna do it. And it is, I I can feel that it's working. Now I can't prove any of this stuff to you because it's all subconscious, right? But I've been able to have pretty good success, and I've tested this. I've actually done some. Maybe you'll say this is unscrupulous. I've told people that they can do things that I really don't think they can do. Mm-hmm. And that's not my MO. Mm-hmm. I tell people to trust me. If I say you can do it, you can do it. But occasionally, just to test this ability, 
I will tell people things that I don't think are true about them <laughs> and try to get them to believe in themselves because they can make it true. So I don't believe that they have it right now, mm -hmm. but I do believe that they are capable of having it. And so I will tell people that they already have it and that I, I will give them all that nonverbal trust and faith in them. And I've been putting a lot of faith in a lot of people lately. And it's working. It's it's working good. And, and I wrote something on my Instagram about people needing, needing somebody to believe in you, man. It's hard. But if you can do that for somebody, it, it might be a trick. Yeah. <laughs> it might be unscrupulous. Yeah. I might be cheating them out of something. But then they start believing in themselves. What's so bad about that? Not Nothing. That reminds me, and I may get the coach wrong, but I think it was Coach Cooper at Ohio State where I read an article a long time ago. Obviously, it stuck with me because I still remember this, where he was at a restaurant and somebody was there with their kid, seven-year-old football player, and John took the time, bring the kid over, introduced because he's a football fan, like was feeling the kid's head, you know, feeling his wrist, feeling his knees, I hear you going, yeah. and then said, you know, look, you have everything it takes to do whatever you want to do in the sport of football. Yeah. I've been around a long time. You have the structure. And – we know that's probably, you know, BS, right? right? But to that kid. That might be it. I wish I would have known who the kid is or if hmm. I could find the story. He's probably playing a D1 football right now. Maybe. <laughs> so sometimes people just need a point of crystallization. They're out there and they don't, have, they don't have a thing. And if you give them, you say, I believe in you and I believe you have what it takes. And maybe you actually don't see it in them yet. But how do you fucking, how do you know? what they have inside mm -hmm. them or not, mm -hmm. right? So we can we can say as coaches, we can I can look at him and I can look at him and I can tell you where they're going to go and that's bullshit, you know it, bullshit. Because mm -hmm. you get surprised, don't you? Almost that <laughs> So, so uh, you know, I don't see the harm in extending faith to people when, it, when it, they can come through with it. Now, if you tell them they can fly, then that's not going to help them. Because yeah. they can't fly. But if you tell them, hey, I think you could get to this level. I think you have what it takes. I, I can see that in you. And maybe you don't see it at the moment, but you see the potential for it. So you can't lie to them outright. Yeah. And so I, maybe, I, maybe I exaggerated my, my unscrupulousness. Before. Yeah, well. I'm not lying to them. I do see it in them in the future. I see a, a version of them that they could be if they wanted to, mm -hmm. if they want to pay the price, if they want to put in the time, if they start believing in themselves. So I give them that little, that little point of crystallization that they might be able to build on, just like Cooper did with that mm -hmm. kid. Hey, you got it what it takes. If you want to, if you want to play pro ball, you you're you're the kind of kid that could do it. Yeah. What what? Who the hell knows if he could play pro ball or not? How many things have to happen for him to get to the pros? A million, but. If someone says, well, you could probably play, maybe you'll get a college game, but you can't go any further than that. Maybe you get high school. You might be able to start at high school. You're setting up a limit. Mm -hmm. well, there's a flip side. That? There's a flip side right. of that, though, too, right? Because I can probably guarantee everybody that plays in the NFL had somebody at some point in their time when they were a child say, look, man, put those NFL dreams aside. Yeah. That, you we, never we know, know stories like that. Yeah. I mean, you never know. You know I don't want to go down this hole too deep, but I'm just curious. Yeah, okay. That's um, right. When <laughs> when you were working that program with the at risk kids from graduating yeah. from high school, what was the success rate? How were you guys doing with that? I don't know the numbers. Uh, you know, my wife ran it. I just worked there. I just taught. Mm -hmm. um, but it was pretty damn good. And we and and you know, all those kids were were out. They were all counted out. And so if we got one. Well, we, so I, I, we, I'm, I'm we one. Win. <laughs> so yeah, I'm yeah, kind of one so, of those. So they, That's why I'm asking. Okay. I, I don't know the actual numbers, but it was, I know that we had half of them. I know that we turned half of those kids that were not going to make it. And they had different reasons. You know, some of them were drug addicts or they're selling drugs or they got, you know, uh, a, a, a a rap sheet and they've been in and out of juvie and some of them are just bad at they're on somewhere on the spectrum and they cannot function in a giant mm -hmm. school and they need a special school and, and we gave them that special school so there was five things five types of kids that needed help mm -hmm. and some of them were just socially so socially paralyzed that they could not function in a regular high school and we put them in this situation and they did fine but it I hope I don't speak out of turn but it had to be 
fifty percent. I, I, I think most of them do. That's, but, that's great. Though. But I don't know. But yeah, I know. I'm just curious. People could look it up. Like it was the Oasis School in New uh, in uh, Olentangy, and it's it's I think it's pretty pretty well documented there. But even if it was a couple kids a year, what well, if the one kid and only you know? Right. <laughs> that's that's well put, Dave. If it's that, if you're that kid, you win, man. Yeah. And yeah. we lost some, you know, we had some suicides and we had, it's a, it's a tough group of kids and they yeah. got parents that have the same problems they do. They got a parole officer. Their parents got a parole mm. officer. They got an ankle bracelet. Their parents yeah, got Yeah, I mean, a, those are, those are really, tough. those are tough, tough. They're the hard. spectrum ones was kind of where I felt more, yeah. you know, those. And they're tough too. They're they tough, put, but it's different. They can do it, but they yeah. don't, they don't have the opportunity. And so that yeah. was what that was all about. And I, I worked with a lot of, I worked pretty much with the higher functioning ones, you know, but, um, you know, I spend a lot of my time not teaching science, but talking to them about their life. Like sort of what I do, sort of what I do in the training, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, and, yeah, so there's some crossover there. But that um, that idea that you can learn a lot or you can pick up a lot from nonverbal communication. And so I, I sort of see what I just did that. there. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. It's the same thing you just did here today that you said that you really didn't have a very good. That you're still learning and progressing. You are still learning and progressing, yeah. but you were doing it then too. Yeah, it you just weren't as yeah, right? aware of that. Yeah. But now that you're more aware, yeah. it's gonna, it's gonna yeah. skyrocket. Well, I feel that it has, and I, yeah. I'm trying to. And then, and uh, so I'm getting that kind of reward. So you asked about this. Uh, mm-hmm. What did I learn? You turned that backwards mm-hmm, around. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so um, I look at it this way, and I think I've said this before on the show, but it bears repeating because it's it's important and it's true still. So I'm going to say it twice. When, when you spend your hour with somebody, personal training, and you don't grow, then all you get is regular, ordinary, everyday money mm-hmm. for, your, for your life because you traded that hour of your life for regular old money. But if you try to improve too and you get something out of that hour and you grow too, you get the money, but you're growing as yes. a person too. Yeah. And so I'd rather do that. So now that I've become aware of that, it's it's one of the things that I try to um, try to get more out of. Yeah, I, want, I want more. So that may sound greedy, right? I want my money, and I want to grow, and I want to learn stuff. Mm-hmm. And that might be greedy, but, you know, my life is important to me. And I'm running out of time, and mm-hmm. I'm running out of hours. So if I give you one, and I get nothing out of it except for money, that's not a good trade for me. No. And the, the biggest takeaway for the people listening here, and this is why I spent so much time kind of going down this little hole that we went down, is... He's been doing this for four decades and he's still learning Mm -hmm. every single time he goes in the gym, you know, so there's never comes a point in time where you know everything. Actually, I think the longer you're in it, you realize the less you know. Mm -hmm. I (laughs) thought I knew it all after like the first couple of years of college. (laughs) I I didn't even have a degree yet. And I'm like, look at all this stuff I know, man, I can, Mm -hmm. I can do that. And and, yeah, that was... That's the last time I thought I knew it all. It's that, it's that <laughs> level of awareness, right? As soon, yeah, as, you become, awareness, right? as soon as you become aware that something is greater than what your current situation is, what yeah. your current knowledge base is, it's like, oh, shit. Mm. It's like, <laughs> I don't know anything. It's kind of frightening, too, yeah. because you can go down one hole or say you, you debate, which mm-hmm. they're pointless at this point in my life with anybody at this point. I can get in a debate with anybody you know, about anything training-related. It's, I don't care, mm-hmm. but let's let's say that they have all these points and they're all proven. If I really wanted to, I could find somebody to debate with them who's just as mm-hmm. educated because there's two sides of every coin mm-hmm. all the time. It's just who's more prepared for that interaction. Right. And I don't care about that interaction. So that that's the weird part is when you think that you know everything, you meet somebody, and then all of a sudden you realize, uh, <laughs> oh, shit. I feel real dumb. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same way with reading books. If you read a book that you're really interested in, it makes you grow. In the back of that book, the guy that wrote that book will give you like three or four different books that he recommends you to read. And in each one of those, in the back of there, each one of those four books is another is mm-hmm. another four, you know, and it just grows. And, and sometimes it circles back. You read a book and it'll get take you to another book and it'll take you to another book. And in this book, We'll quote something from the first book. And that's when you know you're on a, a course. Because mm-hmm. all these people... And I, I was really... I thought that was weird at first when it would happen. I'd be like, that's what that guy, when I went down here, started. He said that. And now he's in this book. 
do these guys know each other? Well, they must have read each other. How is that possible? Well, it's, it makes sense. These guys are thinking along the same lines, and if it's good, accurate information, it's going to start to mm -hmm. coalesce. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it always leads you to more. And my, you know, my reading list just started to grow and grow and grow, and it's still, still growing, right? Oh yeah. And I, I like that phrase. I, I, I find the phrase that when people use the phrase, "the more I know, the more I know I don't know." Mm -hmm. And that's been, I mean, the Greeks said, I think Seneca said that, or I, I don't want to misquote Seneca, mm -hmm. but one of the Greeks said that maybe, uh, doesn't matter, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. One of the Greeks said that, and, and people have been saying that, and it becomes quippy. And it, it's sort of a way of saying, I know a lot. But hey, but <laughs> yeah. hey, yeah. I, I know I need to, I know I need to little, know a little bit more. They, but mm -hmm. if you really break that down, and you really <laughs> accept that, you start to realize, yeah, I know a lot of things. You, I don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of things, but there's so much more to know. There's so many more levels. And sometimes those levels don't go up. They go in. They become more and more subtle. And, and there's something to be said for the quality of subtle knowledge. Knowing tiny differences between things. You know, being able to pick up a nine millimeter bullet in the dark and know it's a nine millimeter bullet by feel. You know, not a 40 cal. Mm -hmm. Good luck. I mean, but if you do it enough, there's a subtle difference and there's subtle differences in everything. And that's a deeper knowledge. That's a deeper relationship with ammunition in this mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. Right? And, 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 and it's that way with everything. You don't necessarily have to go further. You can go deeper. And you can get more and more and more subtle. I think relationships with people are like this. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I think they are. But uh, you can go deeper into somebody and learn really small, tiny things about them that don't need to be learned. Don't have to go there. Don't have to learn that about them. But that person then becomes a different quality to you that trainee becomes a different quality to you and you start to have a different experience with them. Your life with them or with that thing has a different flavor. It has a different texture. It has a different experience. It's, mm -hmm. it's a new thing and it might be only small and sometimes, sometimes those really, really tiny differences end up being a big bang. It just changes a lot. And how could something so small, I've been doing this all this time, Cooks know this. Mm. Cooks know this. They know that they've been making this beautiful dish all this time, and they they decide to change a little thing so, and it, and something happens. Something magical happens for them. And I think it can't. It's not always that way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes subtle things don't mean shit. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. They they don't matter. Mm -hmm. They don't add up. They don't count really. And so not every subtlety is an improvement, right? But some really are. And they change the quality of your experience. And I'm all about the experience of life now. I'm all about, you know, this is this is it. This is what I get. And am I going to just go through it and survive? Or am I going to try to get some sort of deeper experience? Mm -hmm. Richer experience. I use that term a lot. Richer a lot. But, uh, yeah, so subtle things can matter. And we're talking about subtle things. We're talking about micro expressions. We're talking about un, unspoken communication. My buddy Mike is a uh, he's top top world class salesman. He sells million dollars of hospital equipment and stuff. And he said, the less words you need to say to get your communication, he says, the less that is said, the more is communicated. I think I might have mentioned this before to you as well, maybe. So I, I don't mean to be redundant, mm -hmm. but why not? It's a good point. So he says that if I have to talk and talk and talk to get the information to you, if I can say boom, 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 and you know what I mean, that's better. And if I can wink at you and you know what that means, I didn't say anything. And everything was communicated with no words. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not good at that um, condensing words and oh, I'm not. <laughs> I, I just do this I just this is quite a quite that. a powerful so, combo of people yeah you have like word vomit <laughs> yeah I know and I, but I like words and I, I enjoy speaking so I guess that's something but but again we want to try to look at what could be subtle that could matter in our life and and that might be one thing if I learn to say things better I could say less words 
And I always say this about winning and losing. When you go to a meet and someone says, how do you do? How did you do? And you win, you say, I won. That's it. But when you lose, what do you do? <laughs> you start telling them the story. Mm -hmm. There's a big, long story of why I didn't mm -hmm. win. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of words. I mean, you could have said, I lost. Mm -hmm. But you don't say that. You give them all these words. I got there late, and they, they, they didn't have the right bench, and there was no joint, and it was hot, and, it was, <laughs> and, and then I didn't, but I lost. Mm -hmm. But you don't say, I got there on time. I did everything right. When you win, you don't have to say that. You won. <laughs> yeah. Right? Less, less words. So subtlety can be uh, a good challenge. For, it is a good challenge for mm -hmm. me. And I'm sure in this conversation, I've already said too much about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a, I've always thought, probably incorrectly, that if you're trying to get a point across to somebody, it should be reiterated at least three times before they really remember. That's what I was taught in school. And, and then so, when we did this other school, mm -hmm. the new information is seven times, Dave. Oh, my God. When I was going to school. I might have that covered, though. <laughs> yeah, when I was going to school, they taught me the same thing. You tell somebody, you tell them what you told them, and you recap. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was the teaching method that they taught me when I was going to be a um, physical education teacher, mm -hmm. right? And, and, uh, and when we did the school, you know, it was uh, seven times. Now, I don't know if that says anything for our children today or young learners today or if it says something to, to, that speaks to all of us. I don't know, but that's the, that's the going. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I don't mind repeating myself. Mm -hmm. If I'm right, I'm still right. Mm -hmm. I'm right again, Dave. <laughs> I don't mind being right again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. But but it can be too yeah. much for people. Yeah. I know that. But. Yeah, I, I think that level of nuance is something that seeing it today in action, right? You are very impeccable with the words that you choose, right? There's a reason you say the things that you say, right? Like you, you may think that you articulate things a lot and it is what it is but you choose the words that are necessary for that person to hear at that time and i think that is a skill that is hard to come by i think some people pride themselves on their ability to communicate but the level of nuance when it comes to truly communicating with a, an individual in person i think is is a skill that you have definitely shown for obviously years and years but to see it firsthand today was really really cool to see well, thank you, Sam. I have a, um, th there's a guy that uh, I try to emulate, and I do not believe in all his uh, ideas. Let, let me be clear. So I'm not advocating his, necessarily his, uh, what he proposes, because he's a pretty popular um, proponent of things right now. And, and uh, oh man, I, I just blanked on his name. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, but what I like about him, and I'll think of it and I'll repeat it. I'll, I'll repeat his name so people can, can check him out. Um, and, and everybody knows who he is already. But what I like about his style is he listens to people, first of all. And that's been something that I need work on. And he really listens. So he, even if he knows he's right in an argument, he'll listen to what you're saying. And he'll let you say it. And he listens to what you say, and he thinks about listening, not about what he's going to say. And, and that's remarkable, right? Because you start talking, I think I know where you're going, and I think about what I'm going to say back. This guy doesn't. He waits. He has patience. And he listens. And then he waits. And he thinks about what he's going to say. And he chooses his words so... He's very deliberate about what he chooses to say. And I have that, I have a little bit more, less, uh, I'm a little bit more impetuous and, and just to, you know, let things come out. But not this dude, man, he doesn't say a word that he hasn't thought about saying. And his mind works faster than mine, so he can do that quickly in a short break. I would, to, for me to do that, I can write that way. Are you thinking Tony Robbins? No, um, he's a Canadian guy that got in trouble for saying, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to call these transgender people male and him and him and her. I, I, oh, Jordan Peterson. Peterson. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now I don't. I don't. I'm not a Jordan Peterson yeah, yeah. advocate or anything, but Jordan Peterson knows how to listen. Jordan Peterson demonstrates this kind of um, subtlety and, mm -hmm. and proper use of language. He he. They're never going to catch that dude saying something that he didn't mean to say. Mm -mm. I don't think. I mean, and if if they do, I mean, it happens to all of us. But mm -hmm. I I use him as that model for. 
he's a good model for that. And so I listen to his debates and things. And that, and that helps me, I think. And I, I try to be more like him in that regard. And he has some good ideas, too. I pick mm-hmm. those up. But he's, he's kind of different than me in other ways. But mm-hmm. I take the things that are that are good for me from him. Mm-hmm. Jordan Peterson, yeah, that's the guy. Mm-hmm. And he does that really well. Yes. One of the, the big things that I wanted to actually talk to you more in depth about, about the training session, especially at the deadlift portion from today. And guys, we'll, we'll be posting that video uh, in the next week or two, whenever we can get it edited and whatnot. Um, the idea of growth and the idea of being aware of your growth, of your physical, your mental, spiritual growth that you had kind of mentioned during the, the deadlift portion from today specifically. And you were able to bring that awareness to Dylan and Ryan in different ways, right? By focusing in, focusing out, and seeing even from the beginning of that session to the end, there was immediate growth, right? There was, Absolutely. there was, it, most people when they think about lifting or training, it's, it's the physical, right? It's like, okay, did the bar move faster or was the weight heavier this time than it was last time? But to see the mental component that I believe that a lot of people just truly don't focus in on um, is, is something that I think I would love to have you go a little bit deeper on in terms of how to train that, the mental side of things, the, the cognition, the, the awareness of different parts of the lift, the awareness of how you feel physically, mentally, emotionally during every aspect of your training and how not to overwhelm yourself, right? Yeah. It, once you start to kind of think about things this way, it, it's easy to overwhelm yourself and then it's like your body just shuts down. And we, saw, yeah. and we saw that when, when you had mentioned right. about Ryan talking about the bones and whatnot, it, it, his body just didn't do the thing he wanted it to do because he was so, in, he was just so focused in yeah. on this thing that he just hasn't practiced and hasn't really focused in on before. So how would you go about, you know, working with somebody to, to kind of build that growth over time? Okay. Well, you, well, you brought, that's a lot. Right? No, for you, sure. You said Just mental training and that's a, that's, that would mean like saying lifting weights. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of things, right? Absolutely. So let's just pick one thing maybe to, to, to look at there with what happened today or, or in just in general, the, a general approach to beginning to do specific things to mentally get stronger, mm-hmm. not just physically stronger. And so what we did today was we, we changed our attention and our concentration and we moved it around. And... Um, we opened up our awareness to, to a big, uh, to, to take in more information, and then we focused down and shut down the outside things and focused on just one thing. And so they, they call that in science maximizing your differences. And but there's a there's a lot in between there. There's a, there, and and I use the term, and I think it's on the, because it's a good it's a good easy way for people to understand this. When when a cop or or a, a soldier goes into a situation. Like a cop goes into a, a domestic dispute, and there's people on the porch, and there's people inside, and there's all kinds of nuts, these things going on. That cop got to find the guy with the gun or the guy with the knife, and he's got to you got to find that dude, right? That problem, because these people aren't the problem, but they're there. So I don't need to know them. I need to know this guy. But if you go in and you find the guy, and you forget about this guy who also may have a knife or might be, you 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 can't. You can't close down too fo- too much, and then if you open up too much, you're not going to find a guy, right? So everybody has for every situation, and some are fluid. Some have to go back and forth. Like that cop has to find and then pay attention and find well, who's behind me, who was back there, what are they doing, and 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 those things, kinds of things have to. It's just they, there's a name for it. I forget, but it's it's just expanding your your uh, awareness out to catch more things, and then driving it in to catch one thing and practicing doing that has its own benefits not just for for learning they learned a lot on their own i didn't i i asked them what they what happened and after every time i said uh what do you have to tell me about that and i guided a few things right i mean i but not really i wasn't trying to do that i was trying to let them see what happens when they practice this do a set open pay attention to lots of things my hips and my shoulders and my drive and and the birds and the music and the, and then when I think about just my heels whole lift just my heels whole lift just my hip drive from beginning to end just hips whole lift uh, the bar 
path through the bar placement, hole lifted, and so down and then open, and then somewhere in there is each person's uh, sweet spot. I use that term a lot too. You know, and sometimes you have to, you, to, to learn technique early on, you better, you, it's, it's better if you know how to focus in. And then we, we said at the end, this open focus, closed focus, open focus, and then I mentioned that in the competition, there's no thinking. My concentration is nowhere. Because if I do my training properly and I, I have a closed focus and I learn everything about my hips and my knees and my shoulders and my neck and my traps and my grip and the heel drive and weight on either side, if I do that all and I'm really meticulous at trying to perfect it, that will become subconscious. Mm -hmm. Then I don't have to do that anymore. And that, that, happen, that can happen in two, two, two years. You can get pretty much perfect form in two years. I mean... If they're, if, if, if they're right. focusing on it. Yeah, if, if, they're, they're, if, they're, if they're paying attention yeah. to it. Yeah, focusing on it, right? And focusing on this and getting that right. And then focusing on this and getting that. And so that moving that, that narrow focus down and then just practicing opening up. And then I, I, I really believe that in competition, you, you sort of go blind. You, you give your trust and your faith to, to the quality of your training. Did I train this movement so that I will not deviate from it? No matter what I think about or don't think about, it's just automatic. I hit this button, and all the dominoes fall. Yes. Because I lined every domino up. There's not one out of line that's not going to happen because I did this way before I got to the meet. And so now all those dominoes are right in line. And all I got to do is go to the meet, shut everything down, and put all my concentration on pure, unadulterated effort. Mm -hmm. The go button. The go button doesn't think about hips. The go button doesn't think about, no. you know, drive, drive my shoulders now, now pull this, now do this, sequences of the motion. The, 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 the go button doesn't think about um, where, the, where the mechanics of the bones are. And it can't because all of your energy has to go to go. And we did that with them. When, and I, I told them that when, when, you, when, it gets when they get tired, they're going to put more of their attention into the effort of doing the weight and not be able to focus in so much. And it did happen. But, but getting back to this, what I think the meat should be, or, or any competition can be, uh, to some degree, but powerlifting can certainly do this. Uh, you, you shut off the, the conscious, and you put all the consciousness into the will to pull, or mm -hmm. the will to push, or the will to do, to act. And you don't, you don't, don't steer it. You just open it up and let it all come out and if you've you've done a meticulous job of focusing in on each part of your form then each part of the form is right in line it should be there and then boom and you get out of your own way mm -hmm. you know paralysis by analysis people say or this or that and if you train really meticulously with all these details and you know how to move your focus in and out maybe at the at the at the right time you can you can forget all about concentrating on anything except I want to win, I want to push, I will give everything. The strain. Effort. The strain. You know, with what I was able to do, and it was there's a lot of mental training that was associated with it, a lot of visualization, some things that we talked about mm -hmm. before that went, that's one of those dominoes. It's probably yeah. several of those dominoes because there's confidence, there's all kinds of things yeah. where I can put myself, I can even do it now, into a mental state. That I, I basically just fade to black. Right. Right. Go so blind. There, there becomes that time yeah. where it's just black. And then I have to ask what happened yep. after the lift. Because mm -hmm. I now sometimes the strain so hard and think something goes wrong and you get snapped back into reality real quick. Yeah. Under the bar. Yeah. But then you gotta be prepared to be able to think correct, finish. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a whole nother skill. That's like the grinding thing that you talked about last yeah. time you were out here. But sometimes you know, you're trying to, I, I would try to get to that fade to black and you can't, then you got to have a, what's your backup for when you can't, because you got to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And you got to open up your, you do, you got to bring it up, then you got to bring it back down. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've used with lifters with bringing it in because they think too much. Sometimes mm -hmm. you work in technique, you're changing things, you're changing things, you're changing things. And after eight weeks, 10 weeks, some things should be pretty locked in, not totally, but enough to be able to actually push and not have a complete disaster happen 
I'll put on something that's got a steady beat. ACDC is perfect for this, right? <laughs> and then you just tell them, just listen to the drums and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. When you get under there, close your eyes and just listen to the drum beat and nothing else. And that narrows that focus and then the strain. But it, it's not exactly where I want them to be, but it takes it from this big mental jambalaya you know feet knees head duh, and everybody's telling them all this shit and it's like first off if you're really straining you're not going to hear anybody no. not unless you get snapped back to reality then maybe you will but it ta it's not a skill all. it's a skill sometimes this is my puking episodes sometimes it gets so deep that when i come out i vomit it's dry heaving but that it's why I always puke after some of the really, really heavy things. So I go, I tell these guys I go to Pluto and then when I come mm -hmm. back or I harness all these demons and then yeah. my body doesn't like demons. So they got to puke them back out. But this has been like that since I first was able to fade to black or however you want to mm -hmm. be able to say that. Trust your training. Go, just get out of your own way. Yeah. Is what I say. Now you don't need to do this. Go blind we, yeah, we, we should, That's black, right? yeah, That's we should probably thing. reiterate that you don't need to do this all your training sessions nope. this is just for peaking moments yeah. you know or or whatever but it is something that they i like your point of expanding bringing in because i've never thought of it that way I, I know it but i never heard it stated like yeah. that and and there's an advantage also to learning how to open up and i, I mentioned this i think in the video i don't know i don't know what's going to get cut out of it or it was a really long mm -hmm, session so mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it's not in there, I'm going to say it now, too. I mentioned that I asked uh, one of the boys, I said, um, do you believe it might be possible that at a meet where a lot of things are going on, there's music, there's people, there's other lifters who are all charged up, and people are yelling, and there's all kinds of energy in that room. Do you think you could steal some of it? Oh, definitely. Do you think that it's possible that maybe some of that energy that's free... And you don't have to create. Do you think you could rob some of it for yourself and do something with it? And now that's a that's a worldview that I have, but not everybody believes that. And maybe you can't. Maybe that's not transferable. But we have to admit. I think I can get everybody to admit that there's a lot of energy there. It's, it's not there. all yours. It's definitely okay. there. So if I if I believe that, then here's my choices. I can choose to believe that maybe I can steal some, and I can try to find ways to do that. And if it's there. I get a big boost. And if it's not there, I didn't lose anything. It's there. I'm telling you. I, I know. We've already established it's yeah, there. Yeah. But can I have it? Can I take your energy? Yeah. All right. So, well, Well, maybe. Not, not, you can maybe. borrow. You can, I, I agree. I yeah. think I can. I think I do. I think it's possible. But not everybody does. But let me go through the situations why you might want to believe it anyway. Mm -hmm. So, one, one is if, if the energy's out there and we admit that, then the question is, can I have it or not? And so, if I believe I can... And I can't. I didn't lose anything. But if I believe that I can steal some of the energy and I can, then I'm going to get it. Now, if I believe I can't and I could have, Jesus, what a waste. So out of those options, it serves me to believe in something like that and try for it because it can't hurt you. Well, but it might yes, help. Yes. It might not be there. So even if it's not there and I believe in it, I don't lose anything. Right? Mm -hmm. If it is there and I believe in it, I get it. But if it's there and I don't try because I don't believe in it, wow, I fucked up. Well, uh, here's, I mean, classic football locker room pregame, right? Kids are in there, you know, start clapping, start getting fired up. Why does the equipment manager have goosebumps? Why is everybody else, why does that spread to a level that's so high, right? Uh, it's the crowd in the horseshoe, they start going, mm -hmm. you know, why does your heart rate increase when the whole stadiums is increasing? That energy is there, right? The, these are concrete, you know, You don't solid. have to sell me. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm, I'm already sold on this. What I'm, that are what I'm saying, that, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think they, they should get on board with this. Yeah. And so this, this ability to open up your awareness might be good to be able to do at a meet or in some situations in life where you can benefit from that by by soaking up some of that energy but if you have your awareness so cut down then it's hard to get anybody else's free energy and i don't know if that free energy is there and i'm not going to fight about it 
but I'm going to yeah. believe in it because I have no reason not to. Yeah. Now, I have every reason yeah. to believe in it. <laughs> obviously, I'm biased towards powerlifting because it's kind of been my freaking whole life, right? But I think some of these things that we're talking about, the expanding and the closing, kind of happen accidentally on a smaller scale. Say, say sure. it's a squat. Say, <clears throat> let's say it's a bench or squat, whatever it is, and it's going to be a heavy triple for you. Well, you're standing back, mentally getting ready, you know, chalking up. What are you doing? You're double checking the weight. Is it even on both sides? You know, where are the spotters? Who's here? You know, you're, you're situationally looking to make sure is the bar loaded? Is all this stuff loaded? Even in a meet, you kind of are a little bit, but you it's hope your your responsibility is a lifter. Yeah. I mean, you have to. But then that comes that point <clears throat> to where it goes from here, and it's not, it's not fast, right? It's still shortened because it's just the bar. But it goes from here to yeah. here. Because when you get to the bar, you can't be thinking anymore, is it mm. loaded, right? Are the spotters where they're supposed to be? You already did that. You had to narrow to be. See, that's, sub, that's happening like at a subconscious level. I'm sure everybody knows about this kind of thing, but we're saying it out loud in words. Yeah, yeah. And, and when we say it out loud in words, then we, have an, then we have a chance to train it. We have a chance to practice it. And we have a chance to get better at it. Otherwise, you just have to get better by osmosis. And I think people do. Right. But if I don't have to leave it to chance and I can facilitate it and I can get better and better at stealing energy or absorbing energy or allowing energy to be mine, that's just out there for free. I'm not taking yours away from you. Mm -hmm. I'm not a vampire energy vampire, that kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. I just think that <clears throat> energy is the currency of the universe. So it is out there. The question is, can we find a way to, to co-op some of it for our purposes? And maybe we can, maybe we can't. But again, if I don't believe we can, I'm not even going to be looking for it. Exactly. And if I believe I can, I might or I might not. But either way, if I believe in it, then I have a chance, if it's real, to mm -hmm. use it. And yeah. if it's not real, I didn't lose anything. There's no harm in that. Mm -hmm. I think the, the other side of this coin, and it's something you had mentioned uh, during the deadlift portion as well, is to be able to expand and focus in it starts to, if, if your technique is not locked in, it starts to distract your ability to maintain proper technique. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that just a little bit too? Well, so if, if, we, open our, if, we, open our, <coughs> if we open our awareness, that is an opportunity for distractions to, to, to pull us in the wrong direction. But it's also an opportunity by opening your awareness to decide what figure and ground is. What's the important things, what's not the important mm. things. I'm going to be aware of it all, what's important, what's not important. And it gives you another opportunity to discipline yourself to stay on task. There's all kinds of things I could be distracted. I think one of the boys said when you, when you asked me to think about the bird, I lost all of it. Mm -hmm. he, he got so distracted that he... And, and, and so that, that happens. And, and our, awareness, our awareness moves and it shifts. And, and we can... We can we can only be aware of one thing at a time. There is no multitasking. There is no doing two things at once. What there is is doing one thing very, and, and at a time very quickly. So people can appear to multitask, and they can be very good at it. But what they're really doing is two things one at a time, not, not two things at the same time. They're doing two things at two different times very quickly. And the faster you can toggle back and forth, the more it looks like you're multitasking but the brain doesn't work that way it just it, they've made that clear now in the studies but it feels like it does right mm -hmm. it feels like we can do we can juggle i call it juggling right it feels like we can do that so the the the, the opportunity for distractions increases and so that's a good way to check on people to see if they are easily distracted and if they are then we can we can do things to help them fight distraction. We can purposefully put distractions in front of them and see if they can stay focused, right? There's a way to train anything you want to, but it's not sexy, it's not cool, it's just hard fuck, hard work. Mm -hmm. It's just hard work if you want to do it. But people are good at it, and so some people are really good at it already, and we think that, well, I just can't do that. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe we don't have to be born with every skill that we want to develop. And maybe we can be born with no ability at all and build it into something. And I'm, I'm a big believer in training. And just you can train. I think you can train anything. Well, a lifter needs to know that. And this, I mean, what you just said brought back when I was at Westside squatting, and this would happen not super regularly, but enough to be able to mess us up. 
you start get running, you know, getting ready to go up to the bar. Hold, hold, whoa, whoa, wait. You're already in your mind saying, oh, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Wait's An interruption. Not, wait's not right. Yep. We because a misload. And it was not a misload. It was just purposely, intentionally ah. trying to screw this person up. Because guaranteed, you're going to go to a meet at some point in time as a lifter. You're going to be ready. You're going to go to the bar, and something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's going to be I a misload. Or the lifter before you gets hurt. Mm-hmm. So now instead of your five minutes, you got and you're all minutes. wrapped up and you got to unwrap. And so you we trained re- those things. We had yeah. we were ready for those things. And that's why uh, well, that's why Louis says we busted each other's balls as hard as we did sometimes, because when we went to the meet, that was easy compared to what was happening right. in the gym. There was a guy I'm going to. I think it was Tom Skyver from Michigan, Detroit, maybe mm-hmm. um, he used to go around to meets and stuff and he would buy shitty equipment. He'd buy bent bars, and he'd buy mis- mismatched plates. And he said, we always train with this. <laughs> we train with benches that are worn out. We train with benches that aren't square. We, we, you know, we unline the benches with the, with the roof mm-hmm. um, girders and stuff. And we, we, fuck, we screw it up all the time. And we train with the worst equipment. And then when we come to the meet, we get pretty nice equipment, and it's easier for us. Mm-hmm. And so there's a... There's a uh, there's a fallacy to that, but there's also the the, the idea because you want to train with the thing you're going to use, probably. Yeah. But but back but then it, you never it, knew what oh, you were going to have. No, it's I not mean, like yeah. it is now. No, yeah, it, it really could be. You could get a bent bar, and, uh, and you did. Yeah. Well, let me. I mean, I'll, this is just to kind yeah. of reiterate the point because things are better now. How many times, being the bench specialist that you were, how many times did you go out on the bench, sit down on it, and then immediately you're like, oh shit, this is not wrong 17, height, wrong height, but you had a plan. Okay, I got to change my setup. I got to change this. Yeah. Or sometimes it's like a little too hot. That happened to me a couple times. So you know what I did, Dave? I made these half-inch blocks out of wood, and I put that uh, mineral tape on them. And I had like several of them. And I checked the bench before I went out. And if it wasn't to height, I, mm-hmm. I, said, I told the judges, I want to be able to have my guys come out. They'll run out here. They'll unload the bar. They'll, they'll put my little blocks mm-hmm. in to make the the bench the height that i that is al- i'm allowed the, to have the, the allowed the re- legal height legal height <laughs> and then when when i'm done you we can either leave it there for everybody or i'll just have my guys take it mm-hmm. off mm-hmm. and most meat directors would allow that they were but the, but it but happened you I mean, could what? get mm-hmm. you yeah, but see if you didn't have your little blocks and your guys to, to run out in in the time mm-hmm. that you had to get to get lift and you had to lift on a bench that you didn't train on nope. or that was not legal height or a bar that was, you know, they were, they were, they were just getting into thicker bars and, mm-hmm. and that you know, it was just Texas Power Bar all the time. And then you could put your hands on and go, this is not mm-hmm. Texas Power Bar. And, and, and you had to say, well, I have to do what I have to do anyway mm-hmm. in spite of that. And so a little bit of that in training is good. Tom Skyver, like, no, it was all right. That was a little remember. too much, yeah, I think. But, too much. but I do like his idea, his attitude of – making my training harder than my competition by a little bit it's sort of that over distance if i if i run a mile i'm going to train a mile and a quarter a mile mm-hmm. and a half two miles and and i'm and a mile's going to be short for me right it's gonna be easier but you don't want to go too far with that but i think a little bit of that you know getting interrupted getting distracted um somebody saying some shit to you that you don't mm-hmm. like right before mm-hmm. you're trying for something serious mm-hmm. It's it's harsh, but uh, I think it's good for us. It builds resilience. It builds I believe so. the ability to adapt on the spot, and and you got to have some of that. So we do want to be as specific as possible, and we hope that everything goes perfectly. But it doesn't all the time. <laughs> we hope that our plan is perfect. But if you don't have some flexibility, and you and you're not ready for that, and you haven't been flexible, I mean, it's it's it throws some guys right out the window. Yeah. And then they start complaining and then just get down on this spiral of they this yeah. and they that. And then it becomes their, it's, it's not even their meat anymore. It's not. They're they lost. Done. They're done. Yeah. They lost. Yeah. You so know, you control what you can and right, there you go. Right. And then you adapt to what you can't. Mm-hmm. And so if you didn't practice adapting, you're just going to You're not bitch. very good at it. You're going to try, <laughs> yeah. but you're not skilled at it. You have good excuses you're, when it's over. That's right. Though. Talk. Talk. <laughs> right. And it's not your fault anymore. Yep. And it's not, but I'm going to adapt. I'm going to mm-hmm. practice adapting a little bit, a little bit. Not 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 more than I'm going to practice specificity, yeah. but I am going to be able to Well, at adapt. the same time, it's still a competition. 
and everybody you're competing against has competed in the same environment that you are. Yes. So, but wow. They're, but they're not built the same. Yeah. And so you're... Your leverage on a on a yeah. twelve inch bench or a fourteen inch bench or that's 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 different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so some people are more disadvantaged than others by a an out of standard situation. Most definitely. And some people are not. And 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 so we're just talking about the ability to have things go wrong or to have some distraction come into our awareness and to be able to deal with that. And I think really good athletes mm. all can do that. Yeah. See, some, some though, are the for the bench. I, I, I've always liked to make fun of this. Some are the far out right, outliers, right? So the people who their feet can't touch the floor because mm -hmm. they're super, they can put blocks underneath right. it. But the guy who's seven foot tall, who if he tries to get tight on the bench, his hip comes higher than the bench pad because his ankle to knee is... 40 inches he can't put a pad under his bench so i say if he's going to bomb out then the person shouldn't be allowed to use blocks under their feet either they should find a way to make their legs stretch <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I i don't think there's anything wrong with that i mean i'm all for i'm all for getting as many people to compete as, as you mm -hmm. want to and this might be a good segue into my uh my ideas about uh you know, weight classes and transgender athletes, and if you want to go down that route. But if we want to find out who's the best at something, then everybody can compete, men, women, children, old people, young people, and we'll find out who's the best, that, who, who does that thing the best. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to start separating into men, women, children, age groups, people with blonde hair, you can do that if you want to. You can, we can see who throws the shot put the furthest who has blonde hair. That's a thing we could do. We could see who could throw the shot but the furthest, that's a woman. We could see, but we don't have to. Because what we really want to know is who can throw it the furthest. And everybody stacks up to them. When you stop comparing yourself to somebody who's better than you, are you, are you really competing now? So I'm the best woman at mm -hmm. throwing the shot put. But the men throw further. So am I the best shot putter? No, I'm the best. And then you had to add the qualifier. I'm the best woman. If we had weight classes in shot put, which we do not, I'm the best 220 shot putter male that's another qualification i'm the best male 220 shot putter that's in the team division it's mm -hmm. another qualification and we can keep going well powerlifting does i know but we don't have to i i, I get that because i'm laughing right because one time i wrote an article about how many different potential first place awards you could get in one powerlifting meet it was in the thousands because you got police you got fire you got four different masters classes or yeah. five then two different team classes, weight classes. And I'm not knocking the, in, the, the involvement, but yeah. uh, what I'm saying is you, 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 get, you do the world championships and, and they do a sports formula for an overall best, you know, mm -hmm. but, but you, get, you get 11 world champions at Bend for us every year, every year. Now who's the best? And we could, we could, we could look at the strength to weight ratio then that then we get then we get more and more and more talk and debate so we could do the bench press and see which person male female old young lifts the most at the bench press mm -hmm. and that's what i did that's why i did so many classes mm -hmm. i wanted to be the best at the bench press and so i didn't want to compete just against one group of people and say i'm the best 220 bencher and that doesn't necessarily if somebody benches more then I bench at 220. Am I the best bench presser? I can't say that. I have to say I'm the best 220 bench presser. Or I'm the best woman best presser. Mm -hmm. I'm the best woman at 132 best presser. And then you, could, you could start div dividing it up. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. And people don't have to argue with me about this. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fine. Go ahead and do that. But if, you, if, you, if you're having trouble with all these qualifications and... Um, we can get rid of all that. We can just say who benches the most, mm -hmm. who runs a mile the fastest, who gets from point A to point B and that's one mile away the fastest. And then we know that, and then everybody will find their place in that in the world. Mm -hmm. Every woman will find their place. Every man will find their place. Every 50-year-old will find their place. Every child will find their place. But the best will be the best, and that's that. We're done here. Mm -hmm. Right or or then you get people like, well, I'm the best this at this at this at this, and that that's a delusion. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't disagree because powerlifting is a train wreck. It, it always has been because there is like three thousand different iterations. That's before you look at 
single ply, multiply, raw sleeves mm-hmm. or, or raw yeah. with sleeves, raw yeah. with wraps. I mean, there's so we many different things. We don't need any of that. We could get rid of all the gear and just go. Yeah. Or we could let you do whatever. I mean, but but these decisions have been made. Yeah. And they're fine because that's how laws are made. You know, at one point, America decided there's no, we're not going to drink any alcohol here for 10 years. And then we decided, yeah, we are. Well, what changed? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. We just chose that. That we chose that as our laws, as our rules, and so people can choose rules in the bench press and in the. And you, and you could, you, you should have some justification, for why the rule is the rule. So here's a good one for you, Dave. Uh, you can't leave your thumb loop on. When mm-hmm. you wrap your wrist, that's illegal. And if you do that, even though you lifted the weight, it's disqualified. Mm-hmm. Now, what I all I want to know. So that's the rule, and mm-hmm. I will follow it. But. Can you tell me why that's the rule? Why was that rule invented? Why is that rule important to people? Why do people look for that? Why are we talking mm-hmm. about it now? <laughs> right? I mean, you can go the whole, through the whole rule book and find multiple. <laughs> right. So, so, but like some that. make more sense than mm-hmm, others. Mm-hmm. And some don't make a lot of sense. But that's the rule. Mm-hmm. And so if everybody shows up and says, we, we're going to abide by this set of rules on this day, we can say who was the best at this day on this bench at whatever height it is mm-hmm. with these shitty or great weights mm-hmm. with with the conditions it's too hot in here it's too cold i mean whatever right and so that day stands but if i want to compare that day to somewhere else that's a little tougher now mm-hmm. and that's what they did with uh bob beeman's jump in uh in new mexico in, uh, mexico city i think it was or somewhere at altitude where he jumped way further than everybody else. And that wasn't the altitude. Because mm-hmm. everybody jumped in that thin air. Mm-hmm. And everybody was about where he was at the beginning of that day. They were all world class. And they were all about within a half inch of each other. And he jumps like a mile longer. He jumps a foot longer than mm-hmm. that on that day. That's not because the air was thin for him. It was thin for everybody. Mm-hmm. But it, they, they, they tried to take that away from him because they said, well, he set that record at altitude. Mm-hmm. And they started doing this thing at altitude that was a little asterisk. Like in baseball, the steroid era, mm-hmm. you know, and all mm-hmm. that nonsense. So it's okay to do those things. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to spend our time deciding that thumb loops should be in the rule book or not. Uh, but we should have a reason, shouldn't we? For why I think we so. Want but I think when, where I would fall on that is, you know, coming through a sport that was like that is while you're competing, you don't have any say in these things. No. You're, so when you're expanding your focus, like what we're talking about, that's probably expanding it too far as a um, lifter. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm. And I, it, well, Sorry. especially okay. when it, I mean, especially when it comes to competing in anything per se, right? Like there needs to be a certain standard for, of competition to which to judge the efforts of those individuals. Yeah. Right? And it, I don't dis, like I said, I don't disagree with that. Mm-hmm. But there are some stupid ones. <laughs> well, there, there are, but I mean, as as the person competing, mm-hmm. you got other things to worry about. Right. You, you still got to show up, do what you're supposed to do, mm-hmm. because all that really becomes is drama that you have no real control over. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you don't like it, you can compete someplace else. Right. But I try to always stay clear of that kind of stuff because I knew where I was going to compete, how I was going to compete, and that's mm-hmm. all I really cared about. I didn't understand. Well, I understand why people compete in different ways and different disciplines and so I, I get that. It's just not what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't an argument or a debate I really gave a shit about because right. how does it make me perform better? Or how does it make me better? And then once being removed from the sport, why care? Because now right. I, it's a fucked up thing. It's a fucked up way I have a thinking about it because it's like, well, now I don't have a voice because I'm not really participating in it anymore. So my opinion doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So when did it matter when I was competing? Because I just said it didn't matter then either. <laughs> you know, so who maybe that's where the void is. Like, who does this matter for? Who's yeah. making the rules? And that's where it really yeah. needs to fall. And it's funny because if, if you're going into a competition looking for these little things you know, to focus in on that is not how you compete on that day. It's like, are you just looking for ways out? Mm-hmm. Are you not confident in your own abilities to compete at that yeah. on that day? Hey, you Jacob, know? I think he lost his pop filter. 
Oh, yep. Yep. She kicked around there. Y- yeah, it, it's it, it's like if you're going into a competition worried about checking everybody's thumbs for the thumb loop, it's like you're you're already focusing in on the wrong shit. If yeah. you're lifting, yes. Right, But, exactly. I mean, there there are judges that specifically just look for things like that. Which, yeah. you know, I guess that would be a good thing mm-hmm. if you were a person that was inclined to lift your hips off the bench and if the judges were too concerned with looking at your wrist instead of your right. hips, it'd be a good thing. Right. <laughs> what do we got here? Yeah, we can go in multitude of different ways. We've gotten some questions that came in. I don't know if you want to jump. Just hit some of those. Stuff. Okay, let's do it. Um, let's see. Um, let's pull up one of the more, the older ones. We actually had a few super chats come in. So thank you guys very much for uh, dropping those in here. And we'll jump right into it. Uh, actually, JM, one of the first questions that we got was about uh, potential uh, book recommendations. Well, sure. I have, I have some. Uh, so the, the book recommendations, I always go to the same ones because they're, I assume that they're like beginner level, right? So mm-hmm. I got a standard like group of things. And I, I give these to my friends, uh, people new that I meet and and for for anybody who wants to go deeper so these are not necessarily books about lifting of course mm-hmm. right but they're books that um so the ones that i first give out are the easiest ones to absorb they're less subtle they're less uh, difficult reading and they're also um pretty concrete ideas that i think have that i can look back and say that that really crystallized for me and i've kept it for a long time so just off the top of my head, some of them are, <clears throat> and I've mentioned these before, mm-hmm. but so again, redundancy is okay if it's still true, it's still true. Uh, the Power of Optimism, Alan Loy McInnes. Every page in that book, you can open up that book to any two pages, and I will bet you find something of value. And you can't say that about too many books, like anywhere. Something he will say might strike you. And that, but there's tw- like 12 chapters and each one deals with a certain way that optimists see things and how, what optimism means and, and speaking of optimism then uh, I just reread Candide with my girlfriend I read it to her and um, Candide is by Voltaire and it's, an, it's a book about how you see the world and just like we, I was just talking about if you see the world as a potential if I, see, if I have a world view that I believe I can get energy, then I will try. And if it's there, I'll get it. And if it's not, I won't, but at least I'll try. If I see the world where, no, you can't do that. You, that's not, people can't steal energy from other people. You can't absorb it. You can't feel it. They won't even try. So the, your worldview about things, how you think the world operates, decides, helps you decide what you're gonna try or not try in the world, how you're gonna make your decisions. So if, if you don't think something's possible, you won't knock on that door. But if I think it's possible, I'll knock and knock and knock and knock. I don't know if the door is going to open or not, but I'm going to knock and you're not. You're going to walk right by. And so if the door does open, I get to see what's behind it, and you never do. So I'm not saying that we have to open ourselves to everything. I'm just saying that your worldview, and that's what Candide is about. It's about how you see the world, and, and the, it's a uh the, the, the subtitle of it is Optimism, Candide or Optimism. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a it's two-sided view of, there's a guy named Pangloss in it, and he's a character, and he thinks that we live in the best of all possible worlds, and things, he's very optimistic and tries to see the good in everything, and even when bad things happen, he said, well, this is the best we can do, and, and so we have to deal with it and everything. And then other people that they meet <clears throat> sort of say, no, the world's full of shit, and it's it's evil and and we just have to survive it and and so there's these two opposing views but he goes through lots and lots of people who have different philosophical very briefly philosophical opinions about the world and how it how it may operate and then in the end there's a there's a really powerful message about what do we make of all this you know do you think the world's basically do you think people are basically good or evil you don't have to answer sam but people have an answer for that Mm -hmm. right and then they they, you get to justify that or or say whatever and so that's in the end of the book he gives some really good advice about how we take all these um 
viewpoints and worldviews and make some sense out of it and make and, and live with it. So it's a great book and it's extremely well written. How about uh, I always talk about the Tao of Pooh, the T A O of Pooh, Tao meaning way. And it's a it's it's not a children's book, but the guy it's Benjamin Hoff, I think. He he uh, introduces you to a few ideas about Taoism. And he does it in a very easy to read way. He's, he's having a conversation with Winnie the Pooh. But he's using Winnie the Pooh as this character who goes with the flow, who adapts and flows and doesn't fight the world. And, and we don't always have to fight. Our Western mind says that you, if you want something, you gotta put your canoe in the river and you gotta face it upstream and you gotta paddle like crazy. Because mm -hmm. all the good stuff is upstream. And, and if it comes easy to you, it's not good. But is, is that true? Is all the good things up the dream? I don't think so, right? So, so some people have learned that sometimes you gotta, well, I can say I have learned, that sometimes you gotta paddle like crazy upstream if that's where you wanna go. But sometimes you can put your canoe in the water and you can let it take you somewhere wonderful, downstream. And so both of those ideas, and so <clears throat> in that book, The Tao of Pooh, one of the Taoistic philosophies is the Wu Wei. To try without trying. But to try not to try. To open up and let things happen instead of making them happen. And our Western mind says, I gotta make it happen. I gotta be in control. I gotta. And that sometimes is not the right answer. It really isn't. It's not the answer for every solution. And it's not also, you can't just let everything happen to you either. Mm. But if you have both of those attitudes, if you have a worldview that says, sometimes I got to let things happen, and sometimes I got to make this happen. I got to take charge. Nobody's doing shit here. I got to do something. You see how, if you have two, there are certain situations that would lead to the application of either one, where you'll get more success. Sometimes when you try too hard, you squeeze too tight. And you squeeze all the sand right out of your hand. And a lot of people try too hard. And so there's a that that's one of the things in that book that I think power lifters can learn. We, we try too hard sometimes. And that's just as bad as not trying hard enough. It's just as unsuccessful. And so if you can learn to back off, and you know, mm -hmm. you mentioned that too. If you can learn the lesson of the Wu Wei and apply some of it some of the time. Not, not all the time, but sometimes it's the right answer. And that's in that book, and there's other ideas in that book that are really worth uh, rubbing up against to see if, if some of the West, West and East, can you can find a way to make those two things happen. And um, uh, the book The Razor's Edge by Somerset Mom is good, but the movie with El, uh, Bill Murray eclipses it. And that's, that's unusual that a movie is better than the book. Very unusual. And Somerset Mom's a great writer. But the movie, The Razor's Edge, or the book, but specifically the movie, is, is extremely powerful about worldview. About how I see the world shapes what decisions I'm going to make in that world. Because I'm going to see some things, and I talk about <coughs> I talk about the the pile we put things that are impossible for me to do and the pile of things that are possible right and and your worldview decides that right i can't do that well okay maybe you can't but i i try to make that pile pretty small i could do that but i'm not willing to pay the price is a better way to say it so i'm not going to do that that's not the impossible pile that's in the, i'm not going to do that because that's too i'm not willing to pay that price all right and then I can do it, and I can pay the price, and then this is really easy, right? There's, there's piles we make, and our worldview decides that. So it's, it also goes with our, so putting your worldview with your self-image, not your self-esteem, your self-image. The image of you, can you see yourself being a teacher? Can you see yourself being a fireman? Can you see yourself being mayor of the city? Can you see yourself being a parent? Can you see yourself, can you see your image of you doing that thing and some people can't see their image I, can, I can't be a mayor not I don't want to be a mayor I can't right or I can't I can't and, and we, we decide these things 
<clears throat> oh, excuse me, a lot of times based on our our worldview that we decide on. So that's a book uh, or a movie. I, I, I highly recommend a movie. I mean, the book's okay. About how you see the world and how important that is. And another book that's also equally as important uh, about how you see the world is 1984 by George Orwell. And it's a book that is, again, about the importance of forming your own, and so is Candide, forming your own worldview. Because if you don't, someone is gladly going to do it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they rarely have your best <laughs> interest in mind. They uh -oh. have their interest in mind. Mm -hmm. The corporations will form your worldview for you. They'll tell you what you should want, what you should wear, how you should act. The government will do that for you. Mm -hmm. your, your religions will do that for you. Your friends will do that for you. I mean, everybody's willing to tell you who to be and how to be it mm -hmm. and what you should think of the world. And that's, that's okay if you don't want to do the work of forming your own worldview, then oftentimes you will get a worldview that is uh, foisted upon you for someone else's benefit or inherited, and you don't even know it. I say this with uh, sports teams and stuff. You know, ask somebody who their favorite football team is, and they tell me, and I say, was that your dad's favorite football team? Mm -hmm. And of course it was. And then I ask, well, is that your favorite t football team because you like the coach, the players that are playing, the style of offense that they have, that the, 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 the uniform colors, uh, or, or it's just your town? Because none of those are a choice. I mean, if, if, if you said, uh, what's your favorite football team? And I said, the Cleveland Browns. And you said, well, do you, do you like the coach? And I'm like, not really. <laughs> no. What coach is your favorite coach? Well, my favorite coach is this dude. He doesn't coach for them. Well, do you like the players? Yeah, I like some of the players. Well, what about this, uh, these other players? You like those dudes on these other teams? Yeah, I really like those guys. Okay. Right? What about the oh, style of offense? You, are you happy with the way they run their game? No, I like I like the, I like the more open offense. I like so you're not choosing on your own desires and likes. You're, you've, you've adopted or inherited a worldview. I'm a Browns fan. I'm a Browns fan. Maybe that's your town. Right? Mm -hmm. that, you, didn't, you didn't choose that either. Right? So, so if we really chose our worldview and chose the way things we wanted, we would look at these things and we would, we would say, I, I, I don't know why I'm a Republican. I don't know why I'm a Democrat. I don't know why I'm for this or for that. But the Bible says it, or my religion says it, or my friends all think this. And so we, we so these books are about establishing your own, uh, your own, your own lens to look at the world and, and deciding that the world works this way or that way. So, Sam, do you believe in karma? You know what karma is. Mm -hmm. You've heard of that. Do you believe in that? Yeah. I Doesn't matter. So. Doesn't matter. Right? So some people do, mm -hmm. and some people don't. Right? And so people that do live a different experience than people that don't. Mm -hmm. So when something happens to them, they see it through a lens or a view that includes this idea of karma. And people that don't believe in karma, like, nah, things, things, there's, there's cause and there's effect. And this caused that. And there's no, there's nothing preceding that. I mean, th there's no, and then some people say, well, no, you know, you, you get what you give, and it comes around, and it, and but those two people don't necessarily live completely different worlds. They don't have two different realities. They live in the same reality, but their experience of that same reality is different. It feels different to them. They act differently in it. Most important is they act differently in it. People that believe in karma might not rip you off because they don't want to be ripped off. People that don't believe in karma but believe in morals won't rip you off because of that. And that's a different. So one is would would like to rip you off but doesn't want the karma to come back because they believe in karma. And one doesn't want to be a bad person, period. Those are those are the same thing. We're not gonna rip you off. We're gonna mm -hmm. have the same reality. But my my experience of those two people is different. I'm gonna trust this dude. I don't trust that dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause he might decide he can get away with it, right? Mm -hmm. And and those kinds of things. And those are in those books, Candide and uh, 1984. Especially in 1984, because they they foist ideas on him by by incredible force, and he's forced to believe that two and two is five, right? And because the party says so. And and when he says, okay, what's two and two? And he says five, and they're like, not good enough, Winston. You have to really believe it. 
you don't really believe it. We're going to continue to, we're going to continue this. Because you said the right answer, but you don't believe it. And, and man, they go until he thinks two and two is five. And then if they change it, two and two is three. The party says so. He's got to do that. He's got to, and so people are doing this now, in this country, right now. Mm -hmm. They're forcing a, a reality on people, and the people are not making up their own decision about the world and how the world works. Mm -hmm. And so we got this election that went, and, and people are crazy about it. Mm -hmm. And because of their worldview. And most of them did not form their own worldview. They inherited it, they got it, they got it with about osmosis. And that's the worst way to do it. And that's the worst way to stand for something. Mm -hmm. If you want to stand up for something and be counted and make a difference, and you don't know why the hell you're doing it, and you don't know how the world works, you just know that everybody says so, or the people that you admire say so, that's not a good enough reason for me. Mm -hmm. And so these books help you do that. And so that helps in training and in belief systems about your ability and who you are and who you can be and who you can't be. And I'm all for believing that we can be more than we mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. uh, and it happened to me. I mean, I, was, I, I didn't expect to be what I am. And if I had kept that worldview, I would keep all those limitations. So when I speak of worldview, if we're going to get back to, to training and, and that, I'm speaking about how, how many limits we put on ourselves about the possible and impossible piles and the, uh, and the, and the self-image, not self-esteem, but the self-image. Can I see myself wearing this hat? Can I see myself wearing that hat? Could I be that? Could I do that? And if you can't see yourself being a teacher and you try to become a teacher, it's going to be hard. If you don't see yourself as a 500-pound venture, and I did not see myself as a 600-pound venture. This is where this happened to me mm -hmm. at 600. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I was the first in Ohio to bench 600 in a, in a place that has been has been known for powerlifting with great champions all the time. And I didn't know if I could be that dude that was like everybody tried it, but nobody did it. And I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to wear that hat because once you do it, you got to be that guy from then on. You got to live up to that then. And I struggled to see myself in that image, wearing that hat. And I had, and that was a good lesson too, working through that. So I didn't have that problem at 700 at all. Mm -hmm. And so we all have these, these, these worldviews that this is how things are, and that's that. And maybe they are, and maybe you got a really accurate worldview, and maybe you don't. But I'm okay with whatever worldview you have, as long as you can tell me that you came by it yourself and you didn't get tricked or mm -hmm. it just. It's just always been that way, and I never thought about it. And my dad believed it, so I believe it. And my my church says this, so I think it's true. And, you know, I've asked people in the Catholic Church, it, it just happened to be the Catholic Church, why they believe this thing. And the guy goes, I don't know why I think that's true, but the, Catholic, the Pope says it's true, so it's true. So I believe it. I'm like, yeah, but, but do you really think it's true? And he's like, well, I have to. I'm like, no, you don't. I mean, you can. we can, we can talk through this. <laughs> And, and we can say this and this and this, and then, is that true? Is this thing true that they're saying is true? And he's like, no, I can't do that. Because his worldview is, I have to take my worldview from some authority. I'm not the authority of my own worldviews. And his books touch on that, those, mm -hmm. those two that I mentioned mm -hmm. there. And let's see, um, any book by, any book about the, principles of Aikido, the martial art Aikido. Uh, George Leonard writes a lot about it. He was a sports writer about, and he's got all kinds of psychology books about sports before he got into Aikido. So he's got all kinds of great books about mental training and psychology of sport, George Leonard. And then he, in his older age, he started taking up the, the he would try to become a black belt in Aikido, and he did. And he writes some really good things about the the way of Aikido and there's a lot of wonderful things about that that again are super useful and like again about trying too hard and he gives this image of uh, of you and I and if we have a broomstick we can push and pull and fight and fight and fight but if we have a rope between us I can make that rope so you can't do anything to me you can't push a rope 
and you can pull it, but I can keep the I can keep the slack. And Aikido is about this balance of of uh, your actions in relation to the other actions. And and one of the biggest things is when someone throws a punch or a kick, don't be there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Move. Mm-hmm. Don't block it. Don't fight it. Don't be there. Let that energy go right by. And so then it's about awareness and sensing the energy before it happens. And every good boxer will tell you about the nonverbal cues and the things that happen. And he's going to throw a right or a left. And if I choose wrong, and if I read him wrong, and I got split seconds to do this, I'm going to eat one, right? Mm-hmm. So these are all real things, right? They, well, they, they might be. I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to, you know, other people will make the case for it. I'm going to let you read about it and see mm-hmm. if, you, if, it, if it fits for you. Lots of people do that. I think that's a, actually a really good segue into kind of the next topic I wanted to go into, the idea of pulling back, pushing forward, right? So you guys are both have had illustrious powerlifting careers, right? And now you're at a later stage in life. And now how do you handle the injuries, the setbacks, the type of training you may do now? How does it compare what are your, what is the thought process behind it? How do you kind of mitigate and manage some of the things that have you know have okay. happened to the body over the years? Okay, let's where, where are we going to start with that? That's a lot again, Sam. Mm-hmm. So I'll just pick just one. Just throw um, it out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I've had a lot of injuries lately. So I had zero injuries when I was competing. I didn't tear my pec. I didn't hurt my shoulder. I had the normal wear and tear, but I didn't have an injury when I was doing my thing. I got out of the sport with no injuries. And there's, we could talk about why that is. Maybe I was just lucky, or maybe I had good technique and good training styles, or maybe I'm built extra durable. I don't know. But I got out of the sport. That's a fact. You have to deal with that fact. I got out of the sport at the top and did not have an injury. <clears throat> we can argue about why that is or why it isn't. But now that I'm out of the sport, I've had a bunch <laughs> of injuries. And they didn't come from lifting heavy weights. So I, I fell a little over a year and a half ago down two steps in my basement and I twisted my leg underneath me and I tore my quad right off complete tear clean you know but it didn't feel good (laughs) and um, I started rehabbing that and I got way ahead of schedule and things were going great and then something gave in there and then I got way behind schedule and I got weak and then I said, okay, it's time to try again. And things were going very well. And just last week, something went wrong. And I can't tell you what it was. I did everything I normally do. I've been biking. Uh, I've been traversing stairs in my home. And at the beginning of the day, <clears throat> I was having a client run up some, some hills and some uh, stairs at an amphitheater. And I was at the top timing it. And I felt fine. I was stretching a little bit up there. But by the end of the night, I couldn't walk. And my knee was enormous. And, you know, Dave will run those blood thinners. And so mm-hmm. getting some bruising. And so something went wrong in there. And there was no pain all day long. And by the end of the day, I went into a lift. And I didn't do any cardio because I could barely hobble in and out. And by the end of the night, I was on my cane and having trouble getting back and forth. So I can't tell you how that injury happened, but I know something is broken in there. I'm having an MRI this week. I had an x-ray. Of course, nothing's wrong with the x-ray, but uh, something happened, and I was utterly and totally unaware of any event. It just started to hurt more and more and more, nice and slowly through the day. But something tore or gave because there was all this swelling. So it had swelling, and so this is a mystery, right? And so sometimes we can't predict or explain injuries. Some we can. I fell down the stairs, caught my knee, under, caught my foot underneath it, bent it back, all my weight went down, snapped my quad. I can explain that. And the answer to that was I should have been more careful, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's a fix for that too. But this one, it's the same knee, and something went wrong completely unbeknownst to me. And it went really wrong. I mean, you see me hobbling in here, right? So some injuries we can take responsibility for and we can, <clears throat> we can uh, mitigate. But some we can't. And some are freaks. And some are unexplainable. And so either way, here's where we should be on this. What do we do now? What then? What then? 
So I've got the injury. Now, if you can learn from it and avoid it, that's good to look back, right? But some of them we can't, right? Mm -hmm. So either way, I've got to fix it. So every coach should be very well versed in fixing shit, right? Every coach should know that. And no coach should ever talk about injuries. No coach should ever mention an injury to an athlete. They're going to happen. I don't want to I don't want to talk about them. I don't want to I don't want to I'm doing the best I can with technique. I'm teaching guys how to hit and keep their head in the right place. I'm teaching them how to wrap tackle. I'm teaching I'm doing everything right. I don't have to talk about injuries. They will bring themselves up. So a coach that talks about injuries or predicts injuries or expects injuries is I do not believe that what we what we say happens. So if someone says, uh, I, I hope I'm going to get my promotion. And like, yeah, I hope you get your promotion. No, don't jinx me. Don't say that because your words are going to change all the decisions that the higher-ups are going to make. No, they're not, right? So <clears throat> our, 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 our words don't do that unless your words are like spells and incantations and mm -hmm. you're a witch and you can put things on people. But I don't want to deal with the negative... precipitators of injury and so I know they're going to happen and I'm going to be well versed in dealing with them and getting through them mentally with, with what has to happen and everybody knows that when you do stuff at an extreme level there's a what's it called an assumption of risk right in legal term there's an assumption of risk people get hurt doing this you jump out of airplanes with a parachute there's an assumption of risk but you don't want to talk about your chute not open, and you don't want to be packing chutes and going, well, you know, this is, these are the stats on this. Yep. You know, these are how many chutes don't open. It, it goes back to, like, talking about genetics. I don't like to talk about genetics either. We all know that some people are going to be this high and some people are going to be this tall and somebody. We all know genetics are a thing. But any coach that focuses on genetics is not focusing on what he should be coaching because you can't coach genetics. And I can't control injuries other than teaching proper form, teaching good form, being meticulous about doing things right. But when we push ourselves all the way, sometimes things break. You know, I like the term about rock and roll. Rock and roll sounds like everything's just about to break when it's played right. Mm -hmm. And when you're competing at, the, at that line, everything is about to break. And that's the assumption of risk. Do we have to talk about that? I don't think so. We have to talk about it after it happens. And we have to be very good. I'm cramping. I'm sorry. Um, we have to be very good as coaches at getting people through that. So we have to deal with it, and they have to deal with it. But I don't want to talk about it beforehand. I want to talk about being in the right position, keeping your elbows from flaring out, you know, keeping yourself back on your hips. Keep it. That's what I want to focus on, not about all the things that could go wrong. And so when we talk about genetics, we're starting, you know, any coach that talks about genetics, I think is barking up the wrong tree. I understand them. I understand that they matter. But what can I do about them? I didn't choose your parents. They had sex all on their own long ago, Dave. I can't do mm -hmm. nothing about that if I want to coach you. you. You come to me as you are with what you are. And I got to find a way to win with what you are. I can't be like, well, Dave, we're not going to do too well today because we're not as tall as that, as that guy. And that guy has a longer reach and he's going to be on it. And I can't talk about that as a coach. What coach brings that up, right? I want to talk about here's what we got to do to beat this dude. Here's what you have to do better or you're going to, you know, take more of a risk than you have to. And, and I'm not avoiding the genetics or the the risk of injury. I am keenly aware that it's there. But I don't think we have to plan for it. I don't think we have to. Now, as coaches, we do. But I don't want my athletes thinking, well, you know, if I do this thing, I could get injured. If I push a little harder, I might get injured. I went into a meet one time, and it was a, I was going for a state record. Mariah Liggett was judging that morning, and it's in Columbus, right? And, and I walked in, and I said, well, today I'm either going to get the state record or I'm going to tear this back. Because it hurt, and it was sore, and it was, and and I had to say, okay, I accept the risk, and now I'm not going to think about it. Now I'm just going to go for the record. 
because if I'm thinking, well, this could either tear or I could make it, what's going on? That's a distraction for me and my attention. So once you accept the risk and once you accept your genetics, I think we're done here. I think we're finished. Now let's move on and win somehow, some way. So I have to accept that injuries are a part of our life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're a part of every athlete's life and they're a risk. Even if you don't have an injury in your competitive career, that risk is there. And the higher you're, the closer you are to everything breaking, rock and roll, right? Mm -hmm. Real rock and roll, right? Where everything sounds like it's about to break. And that's, that's, that's real competition. That's the edge. That's the, that's the place, you know, that I love to be, right? So I just don't want to dwell on that part of it. And so that's probably enough I've said about that. But it's just a choice. But I, I'm clearly accepting that. I'm clearly saying, this could happen, and now I'm done with that. I accept it, and I'm going to go anyways. I'm going to do this anyhow. And if it happens, it happens. And I'll deal with it when it happens, and I'll take it very seriously when it happens, and it'll be important when it happens. But right now, I'm thinking about the thing I want, not the thing I don't want. Not the thing I don't want. Keep expanding on that one a little bit, because what you're basically saying here, because I'm thinking about the people that have joint issues older people washed up meatheads you know like yeah, yourself it ain't me. and what you just kind of said right there was focus on the things you can do not the things you can't do yes right right so from a mitigation standpoint just with the training what have you found for yourself yeah, okay that was part of the question yeah yes. yeah so what i do now is um not i'm not trying to get strong or big I'm trying to enjoy weight training and feel new things. So I'm, I'm getting more and more subtle and I'm learning more and more about my body. And what's so interesting to me is I thought I knew how to do every exercise really good. And I, and I thought I knew how to do it right. And the first level of doing it right is, <laughs> number one, you can't do it wrong enough that somebody's going to get hurt. So good form to me, doing it right means you're not doing anything dangerous and poorly. And the second part of good form is, is it doing the muscle up? If it's do, is this training doing what I want it to do? Am I hitting the bicep or am I hitting the bicep and the hips and the shoulders? and the, Or am I, is the exercise being performed in a way that is doing what I want the exercise to do? But, and so that's good form. And if you do that... <coughs> I think you're you're on the right track, right? But there's more to it, I found. There are what I now call flavors of contraction. I can do a bicep and and speed is important and tempo is important and but I'm playing with you, you send a muscle signal out to do something and then you listen to see if it did it. And then as you're doing the rep, you get a chance to send a new signal out to do it better. Whatever it is you want to do. Whatever it is you want to feel. And then you keep this dialogue going between your mind and your muscle as the rep occurs. And you can get a lot of different feelings of, of bicep curl. And not just speed. And not just... And not just weight. And not just effort but real flavors. And I'm starting to go really out there now, I guess, but I spend a lot of time and I don't have any mission. I don't have to get stronger. I don't have to get bigger. So I have time to explore the time from A to B. What is the bicep doing that whole time? And I, I'm listening more than ever now because I don't, have to, I don't have to worry about pulling the weight up. And I do this with people too. I say, do a rep where you you focus on this part of your hand and where the weight is and pull that weight up and put that weight down and follow that weight in your mind. A, B, A, B, A, B. And now, the bicep don't go down here. It only reaches this far. It's, 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 it ends right here. That's the end of it. Starts here, ends here. Not even, not even connected down here. It's connected to this bone. So now, do this rep. Forget about this. Don't even think about anything past right there. Pull that up to here. And that's going to be a different flavor. 
That's going to feel different. That's going to be a different experience. Same weight, same speed, everything the same, except where your awareness is at, at that, at that, and, and feeling for that flavor. And then I can even, I did, I've been doing these things now, let's take the bicep again, where I call them lag or, I, I don't have a good word for it, but what I do is I realize that when the, when the bicep pulls here, that, that force goes down through the bone, and that bone has to flex a little bit because there's inertia here. That doesn't want to move. And so when this moves, and it's imperceptible, or is it? So I do a wrap where I let the weight lag behind the contraction, <clears throat> and I try to feel for any flex of that bone. And I try to feel for the involvement of other muscles. And I pull the weight up behind it lags behind the contraction because it actually does this goes first that moves that that moves that and this kind of stays back and there's this flex there's this bend there's this little bit of give that i think i can feel but even if it's not true i'm spending you ask me what i'm doing and this is something i do i'm looking for different feelings so that i can do different things doing the same thing and i can increase my variety and then I pay attention to see what I think is valuable and what I think isn't valuable to teach others. And some of it has been valuable. And some of it just... I try a lot of things. Like Louie, he tried a thousand things and got ten winners. A hundred winners. You know, t every, for every hundred things I do, I get one winner. But if I do a thousand things, I got ten winners. Right? And so that's what I do. I try lots and lots of things. And most of them don't pan out. Mm -hmm. Right? But I, then I'm done with them. Right? So, but I tried them. And so what I'm feeling now is this this delay between the contraction and the connection on the on the bone to the weight and what's that doing and i do it at different speeds and and the faster you try to go the more it drags like it 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 does flex and there's and even if it doesn't flex your bone it flexes the the tissue the faster you go the more compression there is there's movement <laughs> that happens in other places of your body that that you can connect to what's going on with the muscle. And I find that fascinating. And that's, that's pretty delicate, and that doesn't make anybody necessarily stronger. But I do think it's valuable for bodybuilding, and I know that it's valuable for bodybuilding posing. Because controlling the subtle differences in muscle can make you look bigger than you are. It's also going to play a role in how much the joint is the wear and tear of the joint. Yeah. And because that, less reps. So, and, that, and that's another thing that I've been exploring a lot. And I, I, I showed you the six rep tricep thing. And, yeah. and, and I'm, I really work hard now since I have terrible joints. I really work hard now to get a lot of muscle work for every joint movement. So I don't want to do a thousand elbow bends if I don't have to. I want to bend the elbow 20 times mm -hmm. and get all that muscle uh, work. So I got to find ways to put to put muscle work in and take joint stress out. And so one of it is the number of bends or flexes and, and that matters. And so the quality of my contraction and the, and the finding ways to make the muscle work harder with fewer repetitions. I want more muscle stimulation with less joint stress and less joint movement, numbers of reps. So I'm looking for uh, a way to preserve uh, what little <laughs> joint health I have while still getting enough muscle stimulation to, to hold on to what I have. And I don't have to. I could, I could get smaller than this, but I like, I like where I'm at and I enjoy lifting still. I still enjoy being mm -hmm. in the gym. We talked about being in this room, mm -hmm. right? This is a home for us and it, and it has emotional benefits mm -hmm. that when we're not here for enough time, that emotional benefit goes away and we notice it right yeah i mean there's 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 a, there's a lot of paths to the question that you pose so right the, i'll throw a few things out there is just with the injury discussion is you gotta there, there there's a bias to the question which i think needs to be presented in if I'm looking at that, speaking of my past, you know, and with kind of what JM said, there's a price to pay when you're competitive. 
and when I was competitive. And I'm not any more competitive than the people I competed against, and I certainly wasn't better than a lot of people I competed against. But when you want to talk about the phrase all in, I was all in it at a level that people around me were sacrificing. And I was sacrificing is a bad word for me because I loved what I was doing. I was paying a price at a level that I tried to make sure people around me weren't going to pay that same price, not all by risk. But if some people thought it was okay to go out and drink, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Some people thought, you know, smoking pot was good. Well, then I'm not. Maybe it was. Maybe it's not. I can't say one way or another. I just know, to me, it was a decision that I'm doing this this way because it's going to make me be better that way. So as time has, so that changes the decisions you're going to make during that time. So the interesting thing through one of the conversations that we had on a private Facebook group is, as I've gotten older, specialists in different areas have taken credit for why I'm fucked up, right? <laughs> so the hormone people blame everything on anabolics. Every issue, if you ever had joint issues, mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. Orthopedics, uh, it's probably more genetics. Look at your family history. Um, people that would fall in the realm of physical therapist. Well, it was your movement patterns, that word. Everybody's right, but they're all wrong because this person thinks this person's wrong. This person thinks this person's wrong. How does it all matter to me now? Because mm. here I am moving forward. Look, I already made that decision years past. Did it contribute? Maybe. Some people say yes. Some people say no. I can form my own bias on what I think, but it doesn't really make any difference. But what I will say, and you kind of touched on this when you said, because I wrote it down here, I'm not willing to pay the price. Yeah. Okay, I paid a big price for what I did for those 15 years. I am very aware of what that price was. Looking back, I'm even more aware. That's a gift, because now when I'm presented with an opportunity, and I'm going to decide, is this something I'm going to do or something I'm not going to do? Am I willing to go all in? Because I have a better perception for me of what my all in is. And so that decision is, no, I'm not willing to pay that type of price. Because mm. I've been there. I know that. But I'll pay some of that price. Yeah. You know, setting limits. Yes. Because, what are your limits? And I have a better understanding of what those are because this was so freaking high. And so to come back on the mitigation thing now is it's joint issues, right? So there's bone degeneration and all this stuff. It's wear and tear. It's repetitions. How am I going to spend my repetitions? Right. Which becomes to yes. repetition. Yeah. Yes. So I like to lift heavy. So if I'm going to do that, well, then I'm going to have to bring the repetitions down on other things, which this becomes interesting then because the physical therapist people a lot of times are going to say, well, you need to do way more repetitions for warm up. I'm like, dude, I'm bone on bone, the orthopedic. Every rep. So you got to balance all this. So that's my advice to anybody who's a washed up meathead is if you're going to listen and have all these different specialists, understand what they specialize in. And as soon as they start speaking out of their lane, that's no different than me speaking about something that's complete, like how to put a fire out like a fireman. <laughs> I have put water on it, you know, it's, I'm a little, maybe it's I'm bad if it's yeah. gas, right? <laughs> you know, so yeah. you, you got to know what lane that they're speaking in and then take responsibility and accountability for yourself. Know what your objectives are mm -hmm. and kind of work towards those. And nobody's ever right except you. You have to figure out you gotta live what that yeah. is because you live it. You wake up. Right. And then people who are in the same position know what I'm talking about. You're the one that has to wake up in the morning and say, welcome to the day. It's a great day. I woke up alive, but now I need to move. That's they're not there. <laughs> you know, they're not there doing that. So it's the way I pay very, very particular attention to the wear and tear, the number of repetitions and then how to cycle it throughout a year. Yeah.
And so then, if if <laughs> this is a common saying, if I if I knew then what I know now, but we do. You and I do know mm-hmm. now what we should have known that, or we, we wished we would have known that. And so this this concept, let's 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 walk down that road yep. of the of the number of repetitions, the number of bends versus the weight on the bend. So we know that when I bend my knee with 300 pounds on it, that's a different wear and tear than when I have one bend with 500 pounds on it, right? So can we trade, can we find a bargain between doing 500 for 10 reps or 300 for more reps than that? and still get the same kind of benefit. Is that a possibility? I don't know that it is, but it's worth discussing to see if we could, if we just, if we, if we come to some understanding of what it, what might be the best thing, then we would prescribe in our training programs the, the number of reps versus the weight and, and try to try to guess at how much wear and tear that does on every knee. For us now no, or looking back? No, for, for people that we're training. Okay, so looking So here's back. a perfectly healthy dude yeah. who thinks, I can just do this as much as I want and nothing bad's ever going to happen because that's not going to wear out because it's not wearing out now, right? And so can we, so so I guess I guess what I am trying to, oh, oh, there's that hamstring again. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to, i got to drink my water. I guess what I'm trying to get at, Dave, is. You need more water? No, I have some oh. right here, but I do kind of drink it. Uh, mm-hmm. Can we can we play around with the idea for a while? Not now, but as 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 time goes by. What's the what's the number of reps that it's gonna with the reps and the we're gonna factor two things in. How much weight and how many bends? And what's the perfect number? What's a better number to program in? More bends with less weight, less bends with more weight. How do I set my program up to save joints and get stronger? Well, the way, if it's a competitor, mm-hmm. the, the way I look at this is I had two phases in my competitive career. There was the front end phase to where everything I was doing was looking forward. Within the next two years, I want to do this. Within the next four years, I want to do this. So I want to total my elite. After I told my elite, I want to get into the nationals i want to place in the nationals it's moving forward moving forward then i started to get injured that was my first pec tear and then it was like maybe i need to be done with this it's been 15 years then when i made the decision to come to west side my whole philosophy shifted because that decision to stay in the game i made a deal with myself that i wasn't going to leave ever asking what if so my worldview for powerlifting changed because then it went from not two years from now what am i going to do this year and i don't give a shit what it's going to take to get there that's what i'm going to do every meet so now it was how many years do i have left Hmm. not three years forward it's like this extra year is a it's a gift it's a blessing i'm going to maximize the shit out of it and so that shift took me to a completely different level i got to get more out of this year yes so it may not have yeah so when i think of what you just said my answer is where does the lifter fall because if they fall here looking forward yeah but if they're here on borrowed time it's like (laughs) no man you no, you need to be you need to be at ease yeah with whatever price you're going to pay you, you need to understand that. You yeah. need to completely understand that. Not just think maybe, but think. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're going to need a hip replacement. Maybe you're going to be in a wheelchair. Maybe you're going to break your back. Are you okay with those? Mm-hmm. And just under, just think about it. Just understand it. That person becomes that person that I think working with them becomes how do you rein them back? Because you let them go, they're going to be like a raging pit bull because they want everything. You know, yeah. this one is a different discussion. This, this, that person over there, I'm yeah. basically saying, you know, I don't know how much we can really impact this person, except keeping them motivated, keep them on track and making sure they don't do really stupid shit because they're on a trajectory that it's not going to end well. It's got momentum. 
Yeah, it's, it's got momentum, and, and the outcome's probably not going to be what they want. Freight train. But somebody needs to be there to tell them when it's over. Because either the injury's going to put them out, or somebody has to be the realistic person to say, look, it's done. And we all know. We know people that should have been done, and they're still oh, going. Yeah, yeah. They just, somebody needed to have that conversation to say, it's, yeah. it's, it's time, and we're not the NFL. You don't get cut. No. So they're done. Now, these people here, I like what you're saying. Yeah, let's talk about those people. Let's those talk about people. the kids and, yes. and the people who say, all right, you know, uh, uh, is there a best way to train so that I can mitigate and minimize the joint damage? So mm-hmm. I'm not just going to do what is going to make me the strongest. I'm going to think about the bargain I can make between getting stronger and, and the joint stress. And so my question was, you know, which which has less joint stress? A heavy reps for fewer a heavy weight for fewer reps or lighter weight for more reps. So one of them bends more times under a load and one of them bends less time under a greater load. So I don't know the answer to this, right? I don't it's either. Worth, it's worth it's worth thinking about and kicking around and uh I would, I mean, I'm going to speculate and say, if I had to make a decision, I would look at technique first. If technique is on point. Let's say it is. Let's say all things are equal, in fact. If technique is on point, then I would be more inclined to say they're better off doing the submaximal to maximal loading than all the repetitions with the lighter stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's just way. Now, if it's not on point, now that joint load is going to be way worse. Right. They're out of position, right? Yes. Now You're doing more reps out of position. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Because now you're dealing with more <clears throat> than just the joints that are under load. Right. But let's, let's, that's true, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I, 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 I'm inclined to very much agree with you. Okay. But let's say that, that uh, we, have two, we, have, we, have, we have the ability to be both people. So it's one person who we're going to choose and we're going to follow them through with uh, less weight, more repetitions, or we're going to follow that same person, same form, same, like all things equal, uh, identical twins. And they're going to, um, specificity gonna removed. So it's not a competitor, just so specificity is removed. Yeah. Let's just talk about the joint just stress. Joint. Okay. We're, we're talking yeah, about yeah. What, what I'm doing as I'm older yeah. and my focus is on joint stress. And, and the question was, if I knew then what I <sighs> yeah. know now, would I, could I have changed my repetition and weight scheme to, still have better joints and get a, a, a similar outcome. You can't get the same outcome from high reps, low weight with you can as you can with low weight, high reps. There's not, they're not, but there's a, there's a place where they're close. Yeah, I'm talking about that. Yeah. We're compromising each, right? And we're trying to find <clears throat> a deal a compromise between, um, you know, getting stronger and getting what we want and preserving the joint is there a best way to do that is there a best load to number of bends ratio i don't know but it's i don't worth know either. talking about it, it's it worth does. thinking about but i don't have a bias have to talk i mean i definitely have a bias where my bias is going to say the less repetitions always is going to be better because but that's more load that's more load so i get more grind yeah but there's there's, a there's fewer of them profession <laughs> called <laughs> occupational therapy yeah which evolves saying? around people that were working in factories doing the same thing yeah, okay. over yeah, I've and heard over of that. Right. and over Repetition. and over. So their joints are getting just pounded, not yeah. loaded. Not loaded. You know, just over and over and over so and over. Might be, okay. So, I think that's a good place to start looking, right? Yeah. Occupation. But load, load is a factor. So yeah. it's an interesting... Well, I just brought it up because yeah. you know, we're talking about what I do now. And what I do now is I try to protect my joints as much as I can, get as much muscle work... Yes. So I make I make I do things the hardest way I can. Think I do the same it. thing. I mean, I we agree on that 100. I like the heavier That's, stuff, but if I do the I heavier do stuff, it's 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 one to three reps. It's never going to be higher. It's going to be heavy, but then all the accessories, the volume's gone. Like one to two work sets, slow, yeah. flexed. Exercise selection is based upon what I know my mind connection is with. Mm-hmm. If if it's not there, I'm not going to spend the reps trying to relearn of movement that it doesn't matter if it's this bicep movement or this bicep movement. That's an excellent point. You know, do what we can do well now that our joints are and not try to learn something new that's going to require lots and lots more. 
absolutely repetitions that's a yeah. very good point too. so i, I like look that. at everything from yeah, the, the number of reps and the quality of reps as well and there's some sacrifices that i'm making there i know yeah. doing my super heavy stuff isn't going to be the best but what's the trade and if i do that the, the volume, emotional reward there well, feels good feels good well, to big move time. heavy weight i miss it yeah yeah i mean big time so but that also means how's that going to wave into the whole training what's going to change for the rest of the week how's the yeah. volume going to be balanced you know and the 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 most obvious don't do what hurts <laughs> yeah stay out of the range of motion yeah. that hurts but guess what you and i and everybody out there knows in quotation air quotes that if it hurts it works and the more it hurts the more it must work yeah, right not the joint isn't pain. that oh yeah yeah, yeah. 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 the yeah. more i can tolerate <laughs> the more i'm gonna go right and i had this misconception too because i had a lot of data piled up where we spoke earlier. Mm -hmm. I had I had ten years of data that the harsher I was on my body, the stronger my body got. I had data that proved unequivocally, lots and lots of data, ten years of absolute proof that I was indestructible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, of course, I'm, I'm saying that facetiously, right? But I did have that data. That data was true. I brutalized myself. I went up and down, and nothing bad ever happened. Right? So I was indestructible. I could do whatever I want, right? Well, guess what? No, you can't, right? And then you, you learn that. And so I didn't have any injuries back then, but now I've got terrible arthritis. Not from the lifting, but I've had injuries. I've had muscle tears. I had a bicep tear. I had this quad tear. The quad tear was explainable. The muscle, the bicep tear happened after my career. It's, it's one of the only injuries I ever had in the gym. Mm -hmm. It happened in a warm-up set. I was going up to 40-pound curls on the... Preacher, a dumbbell, one arm, and I did it with a 15 pound dumbbell. Mm -hmm. But still, I mean, even with your history, there will be people potentially listening to this, watching this, that's going to point, say, well, the way you trained is why you're messed up. Because they do that to me. Right. right? But the, well, the way you train is why your hips are screwed up. The way you train is why your shoulders are screwed up. Yeah. But here's the thing that I always find interesting never had any back problems. So how come you don't talk about the way, the way that you trained your body? was really good for your back, never torn a bicep, never had a knee problem, you see, and never had elbow problems. Yeah. What are the most common injuries in powerlifting? Sure. Back, All those. knees. Never had any of those problems, right. but let's not talk about what I did there. Sure. Let's talk about the hip replacement I had so, when I was 45. Right. If, my, you, if you take steroids or if you do something uncommon yes. or unusual or extreme, that becomes the target and the easiest thing. When something mm -hmm. goes bad, that's the easiest thing to blame. That's mm -hmm. the obvious thing. Well, it was obvious. the steroids. It mm -hmm. was your weight going up and down. It was all that heavy lifting, right? And that necessarily isn't true. And I point that out with myself. I, I lifted up he here heavy and not down here. Mm -hmm. well, what joints do I still have? I still have my shoulders and my elbows mm -hmm. where I did all the heavy lifting. And I don't have my knees or my hips. Mm -hmm. Or I didn't do the heavy lifting. Yeah. So if, if, if heavy lifting is, and all my joints are the same age, Dave. So if heavy lifting was the cause of my, my joint problems, I'm going to argue exactly the opposite. I still have my shoulders. I still have my elbows. I do not have my hips and my knees. I'm going to argue that the heavy lifting actually wasn't the cause of my mm -hmm. bad joints. They protected these. I still have them. They're not great, but mm -hmm. right yeah, my and back's so good. My try to explain good, so. it, and so you'll explain that to somebody, Dave, right? And you'll look them in the eye, and they'll go, "Oh, yeah, I see." So you, yeah, you were a bench press guy, but you lost your hips at forty. You still got your shoulders at fifty-six. So yeah, I see what you mean. It's protective, but in, in their subconscious, in the back of their mind, that that bastard did all that heavy lifting. That's why he did that. And what does that do for them? We mentioned this earlier, you mm -hmm. and I. It gives them a reason not to try to excel or not to try to lift things heavy. Because, hey, look, that dude lifted something heavy and something bad happened to him. So it must be because he lifted. He did everything else normal. He drove his car. I drive a car. He eats food. I eat food. He sleeps in the bed. I sleep in the bed. We do all everything the same. The thing that he did different and exceptional, and he went way far away with it, was he lifted a lot of heavy weights. And he's got bad joints. So... And this is faulty reasoning, of oh, course, yes, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. This is a crime against logic. Jesus. But... You know, that, that gives them this out that I, I don't want to have muscle tears and bad joints. So I'm just not going to do anything extreme. I'm not going to lift any heavy yeah. weights. And, and, and you, you, could, you can imagine how 
they can twist that in. And even when they agree with you, and they see your reasoning that this didn't happen because of bad technique, this didn't happen because I, I did something extreme, this didn't happen because I took steroids. Now, those could be of causes, but when they're not, and you try to move them off of that thing that they want to blame it on, so that they don't have, I don't want to take steroids, mm -hmm. I don't want to gain all that weight, I don't want to do all that work, I don't want to make all those sacrifices, I don't want to put all that heavy weight on me. Okay, don't, don't do it. But don't think those are what caused me, because they may or may not be. And when I tell you clearly that they're not, and I show you the, the, the way things are with my <laughs> the mm -hmm. juxtaposition of my hips and my, my missing hips and my intact shoulders, that, that doesn't, the math doesn't work if you do it that way. But right. they'll still yes. add it up and get, he, did, he, he messed up. Because well, here's, here's then the, they can blame me. Yes. Right? But here's the My super, fault? super important takeaway for the washed up meatheads listening. Sometimes those people saying these things are going to be the medical professionals that are sitting yeah. across from you. Mm -hmm. So if you go to see a doctor yeah. because you have heart problems, right? Yeah. They start pointing steroid, 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 steroid. That is going to be their first action on Easiest trying to treat. Thing to blame. And Easy. then they miss what the real cause is, which could be an embolism or, you know, a okay. valve issue yeah. or all these other things because they That's went straight bias. here. That's their bias. That's their bias because you walked in, Special. you're big, you're bald. It's, it's got to be this. So you got to pivot them yeah. and say, now, what if I didn't look like this? Mm -hmm. What yeah. if this wasn't in my past? What would you do next? Yeah. And you have to do this. You have to. You have to try, Dave. I and mean, it's not easy. It's not Doctors easy. Have a, uh, you have to find an exceptional doctor. You do. You, and I've you. walked out of several doctor's offices because of things like this. Yeah. You know, where when I knew I had the right orthopedic. When he said, okay, we got three variables we need to look at. We need to look at genetics. We need to look at, you know, body weight over a period of time for my hips and what you did training wise. Those are the three things. Yeah. If I was to rank them genetics first. He was open. Yes. He was like, but it doesn't matter because this is where you're at now. Right. Yeah. You know, this is how to mitigate it moving forward. But a lot of people will go in and they'll, they'll get hand strap or handcuffed by a yeah. family practitioner mm -hmm. like that. And then all of a sudden, now they're on a host of medications they really don't need because they're getting treated for something that's not the, the actual problem. cause or yeah. the problem. So that is a huge, and huge that's, that's thing. And that's, um, that's not really our problem or our fault, but we have to deal with it. Yes. That's their bias. That's, that's their fault. That's their problem. But we have to help them fix it, right? Yes. We have to guide them. And like you said, pivot them. And that's hard to do. Yes, because we'll we'll do the we'll do the 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 rational thing, and I'll lead them. You know, my my shoulders, my hips, my shoulders, my hips. I got my shoulders, don't have my hips. Can't be mm -hmm. lifting, right? Yeah, I see that. But still, I went into a. Uh, I got some renal problems and stuff, and so I went into a, a guy, and he was checking me out for, you know, some bladder and renal stuff, and he said, you know, you have to lose some weight, and at this time I was about, ten percent body fat. And I had the beginnings of some abs, right? I was in pretty decent shape. And I was heavy, and I had a big, I had a, a, a skewed BMI. So this is a guy who's, who, who's an internal guy, doesn't know anything about athletics, muscle, nothing. But I said, well, I, I really don't have to lose weight because I'm leaner than, than you are, Doc. I, I'm, I, I don't have to lose fat or weight. Do you want me to lose fat? Because I, I, I rarely show anybody my stomach, mm -hmm. but I did. Cause I, I said, look, dude, I'm, I'm fairly lean at this point right now. And my BMI is up because, not because I'm overly obese, because he said, you're obese, you know. And I'm like, no, I'm not obese, Doc. Mm -hmm. I have a low body fat percent. I'm not obese. I'm heavy for the, the BMI retarded, uh, but not retarded. It's, it, it's not effective as a tool for measuring athletes because our body weight comes mostly from muscle and so the circumference mm -hmm. of the arm mm -hmm. doesn't come from fat it comes from muscle and so the bmi is good for it, it's okay for other people and so we went through this and i explained to him and he he nodded his head and he's like i see you're you're, you're actually very fairly lean and i see that the, the, you're you work out and i see that the, the the bmi is the skewing of it and putting you in the obese category is coming from the muscle and i said okay and he said but you still have to lose weight. 
<laughs> and and I thought, wow, that was completely useless. Mm -hmm. He agreed with me. He understood it, and he still advised. At the but, you still have to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've been to people like that. Couldn't couldn't get past the if this is the BMI, your recommendation as a doctor has to be for them to lose weight. Yeah. And we went through the whole thing, and it all added up to him, and he didn't change his recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Now, I don't want people to misunderstand what we're saying here. <clears throat> you know, sometimes the doctors are right, too. You know, so you could go in there, and what they say is the problem could sure. actually be the problem. Oftentimes it is. Yes. Right? And there may be a lot of people that think sure. they're 10% body fat, but they're 35. <laughs> you know, so and they do need to lose weight. So you just yeah. need to be able to ask better questions and be educated mm -hmm. when you go in. Yeah, you need to self-advocate. Yeah, right? that's a good word. Yeah, that's if you walk in term. there and you're your stereotypical meathead and you don't know anything about the health conditions that could possibly be there, your questions are not good, they're not solid, then of course you're going to be judged based upon the bias they have. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you have a clue what you're talking yeah. about and you can present things in a professional... I had a clue and I thought I presented it fairly yeah. well, but that he wasn't moved. He wasn't a bad budget. doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just just gonna 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 follow his, uh, he's gonna follow the script. And they and they they're out there. There's a lot of bad doctors. There's a lot of good doctors. You yeah. just gotta be able to navigate it. Yeah, there is. But there's there's a there's a uh, if if you're one of us, the, the washed mm -hmm. up meathead group, uh, you you really have to work hard to find mm -hmm. someone that understands what we did. Mm -hmm. And and it's hard because of the level we did it at. So they understand what weightlifting is. They have kids that they treat, general mm -hmm. practitioners, that can bench 300. You know, they understand that, but they don't understand what happens up here because it's not the same. No, it's not. It's not even close. And they have a hard time, so they know a little bit about it. And you got to try to teach them what a 300-pound bench does to you and a 400-pound bench does to you and a 500-pound bench and an 800-pound squat. What do those do? How is that different? than what he's thinking weightlifting is. Because mm -hmm. I went to a doctor and for a year I told him, I said, you know, I, I set some world records and stuff. He didn't look me up at all. He didn't really care. He thought he knew what weightlifting was. Mm -hmm. And then one day, for some reason, we're in there talking, he's got his computer on and he looks me up and everything changed. When he saw the pictures of me, he mm -hmm. saw how big, because I kept telling him, I used to be 350, that was mm -hmm. my biggest. And I'm, I'm at like 260 at the time when I was talking to him. And he's like, you're too big, man. You got you to stop taking those steroids. And I'm like, I'm, I don't take steroids. I don't lift any. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to look mm -hmm. like this. This is left over, dog. <laughs> he didn't get that, right? He didn't, he didn't get that. And he's still trying to drive me away from all the testosterone, which I have to take because of yeah. the, the, uh, the inhibition, right? So he's like, did you get off the testosterone yet? And I'm like, no, I got to take it. I don't make it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I've explained all that to him. As soon as he looked it up and saw the size and saw some of the mm -hmm. covers and magazines or whatever. I don't know what changed his mind, but I know that moment did. And he's treated me different ever since. He, he sort of sees, yeah, wait, I didn't understand what level this was happening at. And every athlete sort of has this that, that isn't a beginner. Doctors understand the beginner runner. They understand the beginner. They understand yeah. maybe some recreational marathoners. They do not have any idea what we do. No. They do not have any idea of the supplemental regime or the eating regime or the the stress on our bodies lifting heavy weights. Because they lift something heavy and they try to lift something they can't lift, whether it's a suitcase or something. So they think they know what strain is. Yeah. I know what strain is. I tried to lift a suitcase one time and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I was really strained and I know what muscle strain feels like because that is their reference point. It's like a doctor who the worst pain he's ever had was a, th was a hangnail. Mm -hmm. If that's all that he thinks the worst pain is, or the worst pain he ever had was a toothache, then that's his reference for what a 10 is. Mm -hmm. I had two hip replacements, uh, I think eight weeks apart. And the first time I got through it and they, they marked all of the pain meds I took. And the numbers that I said, this is an eight, this is a nine, this is a six. And then I had the second one, and it was, something was wrong, Dave. And I couldn't convince them that the old tens wouldn't, can't get to this place I'm at now. I need a new scale. If you mm -hmm. want to use the old scale, it's a 15 now. 
and there's no 15 on the old scale. And he would tell me, you gave a 10, or you gave a 6 last time, you gave a 10 at this point. And I'm like, it's not a 10. It's more than a 10 now. It's, it's, and they couldn't grasp this concept that <laughs> what I thought was a 10 before and was the worst I'd ever had. Mm -hmm. that now something hurts more than that. What do I tell you? What number am I going to give you now? Mm -hmm. You don't have a scale for that. So let's change our scale from 1 to 100 now. Mm -hmm. So now this is a 20. What I, what I experienced last <laughs> time through was a 10. This is twice as bad as that. I didn't know about this. <laughs> I had not felt this. This is awful. And it was hard getting through to them with that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so if somebody's reference for pain is the worst I pa had pain I was, was childbirth. So the worst pain I had was passing a kidney stone. Or you can't compare your pain to somebody else's pain. And likewise, I want to get back to this. A doctor can't compare his effort and what's hard and, and he's really working hard to what we do. And so they don't understand stress and strain and... and uh, well, in comparison, can somebody that squats 315 know the strain of somebody that squats 700? Well, uh, that, okay, I can go two directions with that, and that's, those are always cop-out answers. But because he's, he's operating at 100% of his ability, that's the most he's ever strained. Yep. But the guy that's doing 700, that's the most he's ever strained. So relatively, they're both operating at the same place but it's not the same effect on their body. So they feel it the same. They feel it as everything I got, I'm given. One guy's moving three, one guy's moving seven. The repercussions of that on, on the body is different though. But they both feel it the same, I think. I'm given everything I got. Somebody asked me that once, and I think I said this, but again, redundancy mm -hmm. is not bad. They asked me, what's it feel like to bench 700? And I thought about it a little bit, and I said, you yeah. know, it felt the same as when I benched 400, and that was all I could do. I got under that thing, and I felt like my, my eyes were going to come out. And I, I felt all this pressure, and I just kept pushing. And it got to this blind effort place. And it felt the same when I bit 700. I gave it everything I had. So, and I specifically try not to feel the weight. I call it not respecting the weight. When I take the bar out, I don't respect that weight. I respect my power. I see the power going up. The 700 goes up this way. The 700 doesn't push down on me, crush mm -hmm. me. I see the power. I, 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 I view it that way. And so I try not to feel what weight feels like. Mm -hmm. I don't want to feel the heft. I just want to feel power and do everything right. So I might not be a good one to ask about what mm -hmm. the, eff the different effort levels of 400 and, and 700. Now, when you can bench 700 and you bench 400, there's a different feeling. But when all you can bench is 400, and it's everything you have, I think that might feel similar to if all you can bench is 600, and that's all you have. Well, you're, the other thing would be, and it's been the criticism of a lot of coaches that are not strong, is yes. if you bench 500 compared to somebody that only benches 300, your perception of strength is completely different than the person that's benching the 300 if they're working with offensive linemen. The person at 300 is, hey, man, that 225 for 10, that's can be perceived as a pretty good bench. For the other guy, that sucks. Yeah. You know, but those are, those are the mark of poor coaches at the same time. Yeah. Because the best coach is going to get the most out of the athlete. Right? But the perception. Where they're at. Yes, where yes. they're at. But the perception of what's heavy to one to the other can change can go the other way you get you way too strong then all of a sudden it's like what the you know they don't understand that the oh, 315 uh, when a coach is really strong yeah super yeah. super strong say they and they 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 trivialize yes somebody working their ass off at, yes at 400 yeah yes yes yeah and that's yeah you have any good thing. yeah we had a few questions come in um actually one just came in that i think would be an interesting <coughs> kind of direction here um we have a question from Barris Goker. Uh, why do I feel stronger with suicide grip on overhead press and bench pressing versus wrapping my thumb around the bar? Why does he feel something? I, I'm not sure why, why he, he feels, feels that. Stronger. stronger. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the mechanics of that would be that if you, if you loosen the grip, you might be able to place the bar more squarely on over the 
the the verticality of the uh, the pushing bones. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the bar's back behind, and I've talked about this in grip before, so by by having the suicide grip, I think what's happening is maybe I'm guessing I haven't seen him do it, right? But <clears throat> and I certainly can't feel what he feels, but p potentially. By, from moving the bar from here, can they see that on the, that's the camera? Mm -hmm. So from moving the bar here to more forward with this suicide grip, I get a little bit more knuckles up because my thumb's out of the way. And it, it may move the bar to a more advantageous position over the, the driving. And I get around that by a, by a little twist that I do, but that might be it. Mm -hmm. um, it by grabbing his his thumbs around what may also be happening is that it's twisting his elbows out and that puts more pressure on the on the shoulder joint whereas if I wrap the bar this way I can turn the elbows in and that puts less pressure so that could also be what he's feeling um, but those things matter how about this how we go I'm not sure why he feels what he feels but mm -hmm. there are there's the there's the, the the thing that this that this brings to mind then is that position of subtle things matter, right? We were talking mm -hmm. about subtlety. That's a, that's a, that's that has nothing to do really with the muscle. What are the prime movers of an overhead press? Shoulder, upper pec, and deltoid or, or uh, tricep. What does this have to do with that? Not much, but he feels a difference. Mm -hmm. And I, I gave I gave some guesses as to the mechanics of why he feels that but there's a good example of subtlety that he's noticing for some reason he's noticing that this or this changes how, he, how strong he is with yep. these muscles down here so and, and I, I, I speculated as to what he's feeling with his position mechanically but uh, I think that, that, that to echo what we were talking about the uh, why I'm looking for subtle things is because they can matter. And that guy's agreeing with me, I guess. The only thing I was going to throw out there, and you may have said this, by doing that, he may be shortening his bar path without really intentionally know that he's doing that. Mm -hmm. So because the bar is traveling a shorter distance, potentially may make him think that he's stronger. Sure. sure. But, but it matters. Okay, so that's... Mm -hmm. We're getting to things like it, it matters what you do, like that. That matters to him, mm -hmm. and so that's that's those are. So we had a question come in. Um, we have a listener or a, a viewer that has a meet this weekend. Do you have any sort of getting a little bit nervous? It's going to be his first one. First one. First one. I got plenty of advice for first time lifter. Yeah, let's hear it. I got a I got a guy competing this weekend, too, from. Uh, Colorado and it's his second meet and he had an injury and he wants to do it anyway so I said listen you can go there and you can be in your own place and get yourself ready and I do that at a meet I, I'm, it's all for me I go and find a place a stairwell uh, a back room, uh, an alleyway anything where I can just be where I need to be and then when it's my turn I come out and I do my thing because it's all for me I'm the only one on the platform and then I go back and what everybody else is doing is, is their business. That's none of my business. But I told this guy, and if it's your first meet, I think you can do some of this too. I said, I don't know that you're going to have a good outcome because you were injured and you're struggling with your 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 decisions on your opener and your. So I I think it, <clears throat> if it's his first meet, uh, I don't think his numbers make a hill of beans. Now, he's going to have things he wants to accomplish, but that doesn't matter. Because if he does this for four years, what he lifts today is going to be far eclipsed. It's not even going to matter. And my first meet, I benched 400, but now I'm benching 550. And when you're benching 550, you don't think about that ever again. Now, you have to go through that to get to 550. you got to bench 350, 4, 450. you got to go there. But they, they don't matter as much. What does matter is how much you learn at those first meets. Because if you don't learn in the first meet, you've got to learn at the second meet. And if you don't learn at the second meet, you've got to learn at the third meet. So I advise, I advise this guy and I advise my trainee that when he gets there, open up. 
Awareness. Look at what that guy's doing. Look at what that guy's doing. Who's doing things you admire? Who looks like they're ready? Walk by people and, and judge how they, you know, this nonverbal shit we've been talking about, right? Walk by people, and if, if they seem ready to you, just let that, let that hit you. And if somebody doesn't seem ready, they're not quite, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here, right? Confidence. The, anything that you want to emulate, pick that up from other people. There'll be all kinds of people giving you all kinds of examples. People would be doing things well, and you'll be like, yeah, I like the way he did that. That guy looks like he's all set. That guy doesn't know. What is, what is he doing? What's that guy doing over there? What the hell is that? That doesn't look helpful. I wouldn't like to do that. And start paying attention. And then when it's time for you to warm up, then leave that go. Bring that attention down to you. Do your thing. Make whatever list you're going to make. It's not going to matter later on. You have to pass through it. But who cares what your first meet lift is? You want to be successful. So during the first meet, you want to follow all the commands. You want to make yourself ready when you have to be ready. You want to pay attention to your timing when you're up, uh, the rules, and getting through it. But then, when you're done with your thing, and I told my guy, take a breath, assess what you did well, what you did poorly, maybe write some notes down, and then get right back to paying attention and learning to be a better competitor. Some people are good competitors. Some people aren't. Some people crush, get crushed under the pressure. They fold. They, they balk. They, 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 they choke. And some people thrive under that pressure. They get that energy from the room. Mm -hmm. They love a meat because, man, that's great. That's that's the best. Mm -hmm. And I remember back in one of my, it wasn't my meat, it was, it was my, uh, I was helping somebody. And <laughs> me and my buddy Jeff were there. And there was this one dude getting wrapped up. And he, he was, his suit was so tight that he got up and he had a little trickle of blood coming down because the suit was picked in. But he was wrapped up and they helped him up. And he said, I am ready. And he said it like that. It was just like, wow, that dude is ready, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't even know how he did. But I like that. And mm -hmm. I adopted that. And I don't do that. I don't make those sounds or anything. But I adopted that attitude of knowing when I am ready to mm -hmm. do this. And, 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 and I learned that early on. I liked that about that dude. I saw that at a meet, and I kept it. I tucked that one away. That was a winner, right? And I've seen people do some stupid things at meets. Mm -hmm. And I tucked those away, too. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm not doing that. that. That's retarded, right? That guy's wasting what he has. That guy's banging his head against the wall and then going to go try to lift. Where's that energy going? Into the wall. That energy in the wall isn't going to help push that bar up. I'm going to keep all that energy in, and then I'm going to let it go on the bar. And I learned that. And so I, I told my, my athlete, and I think this guy, if it's his first meet, you can still do the things you want to do, but that's not the important thing. The goal for this meet should be to become a better competitor for the many meets you may do later. Take as much information of good, bad, mediocre that other people will present to you. If you're in your own world, you're going to do your own thing, and you're going to go home. And there's all this opportunity to become a better competitor. One thing that I like about what you said that just kind of hit me is I agree 100%. Probably more. If you can agree more than 100%, I agree more than 100%. Good. Because people do not train in groups today like they did in many years past. So... I had the opportunity to learn from other lifters who were better than I right. in the gym always on what they did between sets, what mm -hmm. they did between sets on training days, non-training days, what they did on sets when the meat got closer, when the meat wasn't closer, how the dialogue changed from this time to this time and all that you kind of just learn. And now all you see is a rep on Instagram. You don't see how the lifter approached it. No, you don't right. see the only place a lot of these people are going to see that now is at a meet. Now, that doesn't teach them everything that I'm saying that you learn no. from this from the training point. Right. But it teaches them way more because they don't have those people around them while they're training yeah, to be able to see right. exactly how. And there's a lot that goes unspoken 
on how a lifter approaches a bar and sure. like what you're talking about the I am ready maybe that works for that person or you or somebody else maybe it doesn't work for somebody else right. but you need to be exposed to several different types of people sure. you know I've known people like that I've known other people that you would never even know they were getting ready to live joking around they go out Kenny Patterson was one they go up yeah. and then boom that last second flicks goes I, I like that steep Amy check when he walks in the ring you ever see that dude when he goes to the ring mm -mm. looks like he's going to have a lunch mm -hmm. going to do his job He's just, now I don't know what's going on inside him, but it looks to me like that dude is just mm -hmm. calm as a cucumber, centered, focused, ready, but not overly stimulated. Yeah. Saving it. He looks, and I've seen other guys do that. Who's another guy that does, is a good emulator of, and I tried to be that way. I tried to just be calm when I had to be calm. And then at the moment of truth, that's when the beast comes out. That's when you need it. Yeah. I don't need it. After the after the lift, yeah, Parker. Yeah. Now it should be I don't said. Need that. You, you know, can celebrate, I, yeah. but you just made me think. Of, I, I keep I, that. I try to keep that for yeah. the next lift. What what they see and up they observe and meet isn't how the training's supposed to be. Mm. So no. so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. No, but you know. but but we're talking. I, I I'm I'm advising that they they try to become a better competitor. Yes, exactly. And so you pick up competitive information at a meet, and that that people don't act the same at a meet that they do is training, that they do in training. And so if you want to be a good competitor, I use this phrase a lot, you have to be at your best when the best is needed. That's when you need it, right? I, I don't want to be a guy that does my best lifts <clears throat> in the gym. I want to do all my best lifts when they count. Now, if you do your best lift in the gym, that doesn't mean you didn't lift it. Congratulations, you lifted that. But how many times, I, I might have said this again, I, these, these yeah. things repeat in my mind a lot. How many times I've been to a meet where a guy says, uh, hey, congratulations, J.M., but I, I lifted more than you two weeks ago. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, hey, man, if we had this meet two weeks ago, you would have won, huh? You'd have this, and I'd, I'd have mm -hmm. that, huh? So you have to be, well, if you want to compete and you want to pay your money and you want to be judged, if you don't just want to lift four or five or 600 pounds, you can do that in the gym. You don't need to go to a meet to prove that to yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you are going to compete, then there's a difference between pe when people are watching and when they're not. And if you ever had to read to somebody in a, in a group of people, you can read fine to yourself. You stand in front of a room and read to the, to the room, and it's a different experience. And it's a different experience to lift in, in, in a competition as it is. And so there is a competitive, I practice being a good competitor. So I asked my guy, when's the way in? And you know, he's like, Friday. And I'm like, who's driving you? He's like, I'm driving myself. I'm like, wrong. You're not driving yourself. You're dehydrated. You're down 10 pounds. You're starving. You're, you're, you might run into traffic. Why give yourself more stress? Why don't you get somebody to drive you? Why wouldn't you do that? And he will, you know. Mm -hmm. But he didn't think of it, right? He's not a good competitor. Yet. He's only had one meet. So he was going to drive himself to the, to the weigh-in in a completely dehydrated and starving state and irritated and stressed because of the meat. And had more strip by driving himself. And then they were going to come and, and be there. His, his people were going to be there for the meet on Saturday. But why, why didn't you get one person <laughs> to drive you there when you're oh, exhausted yeah. and yeah. tired? Yeah. Why add more stress? So that's something that makes people a better competitor. And if he misses his lift, his, 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 the thing he wants to accomplish by that much, he has to think, well, maybe if I had somebody drive me, I wouldn't have missed it. I don't have to think that because I get somebody to drive me. Mm -hmm. So it's not that if I miss, right? And then, and then, and then we talk about things that we, we, we spent the whole time talking about what he should be looking for at a meet to, to, uh, to take back with him to, to become a better competitor and what things that he uh, might be able to learn as a competitor. And those things you only got to learn once, Dave. Mm-hmm. You got to practice your form a lot, and you got to practice it with heavy, and, and it has to, that has to change. But if you learn something about being a good competitor, showing up on time, and I said, "What time are you driving there?" He's like, "I'm driving. I'm driving two hours," and uh, you know, I'm like, "No, you can't. Leave. You got to give yourself another hour now. Mm -hmm. Show up at eight o'clock for the nine o'clock weigh-in. Because what if you get on the road and you get a flat tire? Then you got to change it, and you're going to be 
you're going to be uh-huh. at, instead of being at nine o'clock weighing in, you're going to be at ten o'clock because you're an hour late. But if you're there an hour early, what that means is you're going to sit in your car where you're supposed to be for sixty minutes. What you're going to do at home is you're going to sit at your house for another 60 minutes until it's time for you to leave. Why not spend that 60 minutes that you're doing nothing, waiting for it's time to leave and drive two hours? Why not put that weight at the end of the two hours after you're already there and nothing bad happened? And, you know, I traveled a lot, so, I mean, flights get canceled, Dave. Mm -hmm. You get delayed, and then everything's screwed up if you have to weigh in at a certain time. And so that's being a good competitor. And, and controlling the things that you can and not worrying about the things you can't, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you, you learn those things, right? Or you don't. Then you do. And there you're a <laughs> shitty competitor, right? Yeah, you, you're never, you're always the yeah. guy that tells me how you did well, you mm-hmm. know, a week ago or three weeks ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a lot that can be learned in the beginning. Now, I'm absolutely all for leaving that behind and being you mind your own business and you get your Mm -hmm. job done Mm -hmm. and the whole meets for you and everybody shows up and then when it's your turn you're the only person on a platform you're the only person in the world those weights are all yours you own them for that but you're able to do that only after you've done those other things yeah you don't have to do you don't have to learn those things once yes yes because it's a process of elimination yeah don't do don't do the dumb things yeah now you can do all the dumb things yourself and learn or not learn or you can watch somebody else do it and learn from faster. That. So if I go into a room, Dave, and I put my hand on a hot stove, mm-hmm. and you come into the room, what are you going to do? I'm not putting my hand on that. <laughs> well, no, you shouldn't, right? But some people are actually like that. I've heard somebody describe themselves as, i got, I got to be the one to put my hand on a hot stove. They said that. i got to learn experientially. I can't learn from I'm like, okay, tough life, man. I might get clo- I might get close enough to How it to that? feel the heat. How hot is that? Right? Is that no, really that hot? Yeah. You know, no, it's, I'm staying away from it. It can be bullshit, you know. So, right, sure. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I don't want to close my worldview, right? Because well, okay. it could be completely bullshit. Right. But, we, but, but I'm not going to tell I mean, you can tell, right? Yeah. Well, my, my point is this. You can learn from watching the best in the world. And you can be exposed. And you can pick up good things. And you can also learn from people that do shitty for them. Oh, yes. You can also learn from people that fuck, that screw up. You can also learn from people that crash and burn. And, and those lessons are just as important. We don't have to just learn from all the best people. We can learn from some of the worst people. Mm-hmm. And I do this in the gym when I'm training their client and we're doing back or something. Somebody's squatting and they're doing something a little shady. I'll tell them, hey, look at that person squatting. What are they doing wrong? What do you think? What do you see? And they should be able to tell me what they're doing wrong. And we can learn from that, and I can reinforce good technique by showing them and having them recognize bad technique. People need to also be aware that a lot of the best people that you're talking about, the best competitors, got there because they crashed and burned yes, a they, lot. Yes, they learned. So while you're watching sure. you know, the other error. people that crash and burn, don't actually think that that's all bad because you need to learn from it. I, I I, uh, I babysit a nine-year-old girl, and I tell her that it's not a mistake if you learn from it and don't do it again. It's the tuition. It's your education. Mm-hmm. Once. If you do it again, it's a mistake. If you do it once and you never do it again, that's just what you have to pay to learn that. And I'm a big believer in trial and error, and there's mm-hmm. a lot of error in trial and error. There's, there's way more. <laughs> right, way more. That's way right. Way more. There's more error than there is There's success. more adversity in prosperity than prosperity is in prosperity. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Can't have one without the no, other. No, I like it. I like what you said. I had to think about it for a second. So the, we, a guy asked about what, what any advice for our first meet. And so I want to de-emphasize the numbers and super emphasize the goal of coming away with stuff that stays with you because your numbers that you make in your first meet are not going to stay with you. They're not going to matter. But lessons you learn about competing and timing and preparation, they stay with mm-hmm. you the whole whole career. And you build on them. That is my advice. That's great. <laughs> we'll, take, we'll take maybe one or two more. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, we had a question. This is about benching specifically. He's having trouble, right? He's, I'm going to try to preface and try to put it in a, in a more productive way. 
the lowering aspect of the bench press. Mm. He is finding that the speed at which he lowers the bar is he's under control, but he's going very quickly and he's unable to, as the weights start to get heavier, kind of press out of that position, right? Mm -hmm. He can control it like hell on the way down. He says his speed is he's quick on the way down, but he does not have the ability to, you know, obviously push the weight back up as it starts to get heavier, right? Mm -hmm. So any advice on that particular situation? I did a seminar on this uh, two-hour seminar Mm -hmm. on on a web, on a, uh, I guess it's called a, um, not a Skype, but there's something like a Skype that we did it on. A Zoom thing. A Zoom, that was yeah, what it's called. Yeah, it's a Zoom thing. And I had about 15 people. And I talked for two hours about bringing the bar down. And again, we're going to talk about subtlety on this. But let's look at the, let's look at the, uh, <clears throat> let me start with this. So how many things, so the thing we want to do is press the bar from our chest to lock out. That's the thing we do. That's the bench press. But how many things that we do are connected to that that might affect its success or failure so immediately we can think of where we put the bar on our our chest and that touch point has something to do with how close to our groove on that on going up we're going to be and if we're a little low or a little high that makes an impact on our success chances for success so lowering the bar to the right place matters so I can say well I want to do this thing, and the first thing I can think of that's going to affect this thing that happens before it that I have control over is where I put the bar on my touch point. So we have to train that, right? And then <clears throat> we can start going backwards from that. And I'm going to jump a couple steps back from this lowering position. What about how you get your shoulders set on the bench that happens before you do the thing? So we've established that some of the things we do before we do the thing can have an impact on our success. So, and, and he's talking about this lowering, and, and I'll get to that in a second. But mm-hmm. I just want to I just want to highlight the fact that lots of things yes, yes. that we do before we do the thing impact our chances for success. For example, how we set our shoulders on the bench, how we take our air in. I, I can keep going. The grip, the way you wrap your wrists. Your travel on the way to the meet, on the way to your gym yeah. lift or your meet. If you got in traffic and you're late, you might be all here. Does that have any effect? What you ate for breakfast, does that have any effect on doing the thing? So the more things that you can connect in a line back to doing the thing that you have some influence over, you should take influence on over that. So you can go way back. You can go back to your training. You can go back mm-hmm. to... You can go back to the fight you had with your wife or, you know, you can go back. These things all have an influence. How many can I control? How many I can't? Try to control the ones you can't. One of the things you have a lot of control over is your descent. And so what can happen on the descent? For me, let's do a visualization thing I, that I did. For me, I brought the bar down very, very slowly. I didn't let the bar get any momentum that I had to stop at the end. Because if a 600-pound bar starts to fall... The faster it falls, the more it weighs at the bottom. And I have to stop it. I have to come to a complete stop. So since I have to come to a complete stop anyways, I'm not going to let that build up and then use force to... Because it's going to weigh more than 600 if it's, it's coming down at any speed at all. So the faster it comes down, the more at the bottom I have to push up more than 600 pounds to get it to stop. And that's wasted energy. So I brought it down and I try to keep it weighing 600 the whole time. I don't know if I made that clear, but that's just momentum. Mm -hmm. As momentum builds on the bar, the force you need to stop that 600 pounds. Uh, If if you're laying on the bench and I have a shot put and I drop it from one inch on your stomach, that's that's a certain amount of force. But if I drop it from three feet, that shot put will weigh more and there will be more force (laughs) needed. Mm -hmm. And you don't want me to drop it from three feet to your stomach. You'd be okay with one inch. Because the faster that same weight comes down and the more time it has to build momentum, the more force is going to need to stop it. So we have to stop it. So why bring it down quickly and then have to stop? That means you wasted energy that you didn't have to waste. If you bring it down slow, it weighs just a little more than, it, than it's actually loaded to. So bringing it to a stop and coming on the way down, I, I think about things like my tightness. And that's an overused term, and it doesn't mean anything because it's overused. But what I had a vision of was, or one of the visions I liked, 
was two springs under each of my arms that went down to the floor. And as the bar came down, those springs began to compress and he began to want to go the other way. And as I got to the bottom, they were as compressed as they could get and they wanted to, to, to expand again. And that pressure or that idea of force going up. When I took the bar out, the first thing I did after I gave the, okay, I've got it symbol and sunk my shoulders in, the first thing I did was imagine in my mind that I had just finished the rep. And I physically flexed as if I had finished. And then I began my descent. What this did was it established the, the winning position for me. This is where I'm going to win. This is where I want to be. This is where the bar belongs. And just as a superimposed image you, you have on, on a film where they leave the, the, the bar there and the bar comes down, but there's still a, a, a ghost image of it up there, I kept that ghost image of, and the ghost feeling of being finished. I'm done, now I'm going to start. But I'm still holding that image strong in my mind of the finish. And the further that bar got from that ghost image of the win, the more dissonance built up in me. The more I wanted to be back where winning was, where I needed to be, where I needed to get back to. And as it came down, I wanted more and more and more. And that pull, like a rubber band at the top, wanting to pull me back. These are just concepts, right? There's yeah. no springs and there's no rubber band. Yeah. So I had an image that pulled me up on the bar. I had a vision and a feeling that was pulling up. And I had another vi vision that was pushing underneath back up. So I had these, these uh, completely mental abstract things that somehow I turned into physical tightness and the desire to explode back up. And another one I tried was with maybe taking a big thick ch chunk of rubber and letting it sink into my chest and wanting to push back up. You can do anything you need to do. <clears throat> They're all mental constructs. But they have imp they have implications on uh, how that bar comes down, and so I say bring the bar down with as little momentum as you can because you have to stop that. So if you just let it drop, one, it may be in the right position, it may not be. You just let it fall, and this is really important with re repetitions in a set. If it comes down one or two in the wrong place, uh, so you can't just let it fall, and people do. And another thing people do is they bring it down nice and tight to right about there, and then somehow it gets loose. It gets loose and it falls just a little bit. What happened at the bottom? What happened at the, they lose that tightness. You gotta be tight all the way down. And man, how many times do I see people start out nice and strict and then they think they're staying strict and they're gonna do a rep and they drop it and they go and they stay nice and strict and they drop it and they go. And that's, that's not helpful. Cause you can't drop it and go in a meet. You gotta stop it and go. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get that stretch reflex, you don't get that bounce, you don't get that electric recoil, elastic recoil. You got to start from a dead stop at a meet. So if you don't, if you don't know how to be tight at the bottom, and you don't know how to build that. I, I, I call it a, uh, I call it a pull, a, a magnetism, uh, 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 and 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 the magnets underneath my arm were when you push the little dogs together and they want to jump away, mm -hmm. and a magnetism to my to my finish point where I got to get to and I got to feel that again is when the magnets pull each other. I think a, a big thing that would help a lot of the people is in the training, uh, the repetitions need to be the same. Mm -hmm. So in seminars that I've done, when this is an issue, depending upon what kind of shirt the person has, you know, I will chalk the bar and then we'll look at the chalk marks on the shirt. Mm. And more times than not, you're going to see three different lines. And so that's kind of going with what he's saying there. It needs to always hit that same line. The starting part should kind of always be the same too. Mm -hmm. So what I have a lot of people do if the start isn't really good is to hold the first rep for a two count, just 1,001, 1,002. It does a couple things. It, it lets the shoulders seed into the bench. So it, it grounds them a little bit. It kind of does what he's talking about. It gets them a little bit tighter because of their, it allows them to be able to see where the starting position is. And then after they do the set, hold it again for two seconds before they rack it. And then now this is where some debating can happen. Should the start and the finish be in the same spot? Mm -hmm. Right. To me, it depends upon the person. 
So I would rather it be in the same spot. But if somebody's bench looks more fluid, you know, the, it stays better stacked throughout the whole thing with it using a little bit of a J pattern, I'm all for that. Because you don't want to have something that goes against what looks fluid. And I, I don't right. know if I can really define what looks fluid. But the the bar path is a big one with that. And that's and it does. It boils down to that technique work, right? And I think that's something that gets, uh, you know, overlooked, right? JM actually talked about it today, um, having specific days or training sessions where technique is the goal. It is funny, though, because... And I don't disagree with that because to me that's kind of what dynamic work right. really is. Everybody does warm up reps. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you know some people right. are totally against using the bar. I'm like, why? You can use a bar for three or four sets, just kind of get things moving. But mm -hmm. every one of those is practicing the technique with the weight you better be able to do very good technique with. Mm -hmm. And you know how those add up over a period of time. Um, you have one more in there that we can take that um. we can sit down. That's yeah, let me see. Let me see if I can pull one up here. Actually, everybody. I have one more thing, but I don't want to finish that out. But... Yeah. Yeah, go right, yeah, yeah. So right ahead. That'll yeah. be good. Um, so so uh, another thing that I think is valuable <clears throat> on this idea of tightness, right, and stability is uh, the antagonistic muscle set. So uh, you don't need biceps to bench press, right? You need triceps. But you do need biceps to keep the joint stable because you're only controlling one side of the joint with the triceps. You need some co-contraction on the other side to keep it stable. Now, how much co-contraction? Well, if you co-contract the biceps and the triceps just as much, it, nothing moves. So you can't contract the same force here as you do here and want the bar to go up. But I need some contraction, some tension, some tightness around well, with the, the forearm too. So the forearm and the bicep, yeah. and you you can create, and you just but you don't need a lot. You don't need a lot of strength, but you need a lot of size, mm -hmm. because you want these things to to ball up against each other, and then and then have that tissue pressure squishing out, and that's real squishing. That's not an imaginary squishing. Mm -hmm. That's a real compression and, and release. So there's a. You don't want to pull down against yourself, right? And people talk about benching with the lats. You don't want to really flex the lats too much because that if you flex the lats too much, it's going to be hard to push up. Mm -hmm. You're pulling the bar down just as much as you're pulling up. Nothing moves. So you have to have tension and tightness to support the joint, and that's all. Nothing more. Just enough to keep the, the, the thing tight. You don't want to resist yourself with your lats, right? People, people, people talk about lats and lats and lats, and I get it. Right, and you have to, you have to bend. I, I tell, I tell people we bench from our back, really. But you, you cannot flex your lats at the same amount that you're flexing your chest, or the bar doesn't move. Same thing with biceps and triceps. But we do need to initiate or learn to to tighten both sides of the joint, the lats and the chest, and that gives us stability. But if we over tighten the lats or over pull with the biceps and forearms, we're begging for a harder lift. And this is easy. The body figures this yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but um, a lot of people don't do any of that co-contraction. They're just chest and triceps, and they're not getting any of that stability as they could by just putting a little bit of tension in there. Not too much. Not fighting yourself. Just getting it tight so that it has some turgor instead of looseness. You want it to have some something to push against, right, and something to support the other side of the joint the joint's right. going to take the hit anyhow i mean yeah. so one of the injuries that people complain about the most on the bench is bicepital tendonitis well maybe if they build up that cushion then the muscle's going to take the blunt you know yeah. of that take some of it yeah, so yes i mean it, it and it's not hard to do a little bit of bicep work mm -hmm. you know so i just wanted to mention that that's another thing on the descent that there has to be tightness but not over tightness so you can't fight yourself with the antagonistic muscle groups, but you can't let them just be floppy and loose. Mm -hmm. And it's not hard to figure out what the right amount is. Yeah, well, if they overdo but it, you, they're going to wear themselves out. Yeah. They're going to know real quick. But if you but if you don't practice that uh, that co 
concentration of both sides of the joint. If you're just thinking pecs and you're not thinking lats, if you're just thinking triceps, you're not thinking biceps. And, and you can learn to think nothing and just do it right, right? But I think, I think some, uh, some attention should go into that in, your, in how, you, how you go about your, your technique of bringing a bar down. Mm -hmm. You got one more quick one? Uh, looking like we got longer novels here. <laughs> I think that may be a good, a good one to end it on. Okay, okay, then we'll just shut that down. Cool. You know, I want to thank All you right. for coming out. Well, again. thanks for having me. Dude. You know, of thank I everybody for every paying attention, listening to us talk mm. for whatever it's been, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one, guys. Thank you.